evening. Can I welcome everyone to the 17th meeting of the Justice Committee in 2015? Can I ask everyone to switch off mobile phones and other electronic devices as the interview of broadcasting, even when they're switched to silent? No apologies have been received. Item 1. I'm inviting the committee to agree to consider item 5, consideration of evidence received and the inquiries into trade accidents and sudden deaths, etc. Scotland Bill in private. Are you agreed? Yes. Thank you. Item 2. This is an evidence session. Uh, on the Scottish Government amendments to the Prisoners' Control of the East Scotland Bill, those with an interest in this bill will recall the committee previously agreed to take evidence in these amendments as they will have agreed to make significant changes to the bill. And I stress it's an evidence session. We've got one tomorrow, and then there will follow um, a session where we have um, amendments um, um, moved. So that's not happening today. I welcome to meeting Michael Matheson, Cabinet Secretary for Justice, and the Scottish Government officials, Philip Lamont, Head of Criminal Law and Sentencing Unit, and Fraser Goff, Thank you, Parliamentary Council Office. Cabinet Secretary, I understand you wish to make an opening statement. No, Kevin, I'm happy just oh, to go straight excellent. to questions. Well, that's your winning friends. Right, straight to questions from members. Alison, uh, Roderick, Elaine, that's, and John, and then uh, Gil, and then Christian, and that's just about everyone so far. Thank you. You got them all? Uh, I start with Alison, then Rod, then Elaine, then John. Okay. Thank you very much, Convener. Good morning, Minister. Um, I'm grateful that you've responded to the committee's report in the, in the way that you have. Um, but I wonder if you can perhaps give us the thinking behind uh, the six-month figure that you have um, settled upon and, and some more evidence as to why you, you picked that figure. Okay. Um, well, as the committee outlined in its own report, it uh, wished to see a period of um, uh, community-based supervision to be provided at the end of someone's sentence largely based on evidence you heard about some of the issues around, potentially around um, uh, cold release um, and the impact of that. I gave an undertaking to the committee that I would consider that. And we've brought forward um, uh, amendments which will create uh, a, a compulsory period of supervision within the person's sentence, the prisoner's sentence, uh, when they're released back into community. Uh, now, the evidence that the committee received varied from three months to a year uh, as to what that compulsory period of supervision should actually be. Uh, and there's clearly a broad spectrum of views around how long that period should be for uh, for a prisoner. And um, I'm also very conscious of the uh, evidence that I've received that at the, the, the six to 12 week period when a prisoner release is released is the period of real risk about making sure that they are uh, reintegrated back into the community with the right services in place and with the right supports and with the right connections made with various agencies and organisations. Uh, but to uh, look at how we could achieve that, uh, sort of considered how we can achieve that, that would obviously be around a three-month period, but also to try and give a great, bit of greater scope there for those prisoners that may require a sort of longer period of time uh, to be supported in the community uh, to pick up on any additional issues as well. Uh, and in considering uh, the evidence that you've received as a committee and in considering the issues that this period is meant to address, then the six-month period uh, uh, was considered to be a reasonable period of time in which to address these matters. Um, having said that, I think it's not just about time, it's also about the quality um, of that work. So uh, it's important to recognise that even though someone will have a compulsory period of uh, supervision for six months when they're released from prison. Uh, as a long-term prisoner, there's a significant body of work needs to be done before they are even released. So uh, that work starts prior to the release, and that's the reintegration plan that would take place within uh, the prison estate itself, making the right connections in order to start to establish them prior to the individual being released. So uh, six months seems a reasonable period of time uh, in our view in order to address any issues that arise uh, when a prisoner is uh, back in the community alongside the reintegration plan, which would already have started within prison uh, in the build-up to the release. Thank you very much, Minister. Can I ask you, I mean, given that some of these people will be perhaps some of the most intransigent um, prisoners who haven't engaged at all, um, and therefore um, the parole board has felt that they can't be released, um, that you're satisfied that that is strong enough, and can I secondly ask you if there's a, if you envisage a, a softening from the compulsory period into further support in the community at the end of that six months? You don't see there being a, a clear break, but perhaps a, 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 a shading 
of the support that would be available following that compulsory period of six months? Well, on your last point there, um, I, I part of uh, the reintegration of a, a prisoner, a long-term prisoner in particular, back into the community is to help to re-establish them into the community. Some of that re-establishment isn't about statutory services in themselves. It will be about other aspects. So, for, exact, for example, employment. It will be about uh, possibly other support groups that may actually benefit from making connections within that local area uh, to help to support and sustain that particular individual. Uh, so the six-month period will give a statutory period in which that can take place. So there's a fixed period where uh, that type of intensive work can be undertaken. What it should be about is helping to make sure that that's a sustainable approach so that, that sustainable connections are being made uh, and that they will live beyond that of the six month period itself. So although there won't be another, uh, there's not an, uh, you know, if, if, for example, if courts have concerns about an individual when they're going to be released, they have the option of an extended sentence. Um, uh, but uh, the six month period uh, should be used for helping to create those connections so that when someone does go back into the community, it's a bit sustainable. Uh, connections that they're making, not just for that six-month period in itself, um, uh, as well. So, in your first point around the uh, uh, around some some um, correspondents um, giving evidence have suggested that some of those who are um, being released in this way have not engaged with the prison service and, as they serve their sentence, um, and that's why the parole board has perhaps thought that they're, they're, it's not appropriate to release, release them under parole. So they're quite intransigent, they're perhaps not open to change. Are you sure that for that group of, of prisoners that the six months is long enough? Well, of course, these are prisoners who, under the present arrangements, would get automatic elder release at two-thirds, uh, where the parole board has got no control over the matter whatsoever. Uh, and uh, they are in the prison estate for an extended period of time, uh, beyond the two-thirds now, where it will be very clear that if they do wish to receive parole release then they're going to have to engage with the appropriate programmes in order to address any of the issues that the parole board considers to be appropriate. So there is a there is an incentive there, and I'm conscious that some of the evidence I think you heard at, st at stage one was that you know there is an element where that if you know you're going to automatically get released at two thirds, well, why engage? Why bother participating in the programmes? Well, that's now going to be removed, um, and uh, in there is an expectation from the Scottish Prison Service that they believe there will be an increasing demand for programmes as a result of ending automatic early release. So, um, and they're working on that principle as well uh, because prisoners will no longer have the automatic element to release. So I understand the, the, the point you're making, but I do think there is also uh, the benefit that we get from reducing uh, the scope for individuals just to be released um, automatically irrespective as to whether they've engaged or not. There is, of course, even for a prisoner who may have an extended sentence, who under these provisions will have to serve their whole sentence in uh, custody, and they may then have an hour, year or two years or three years of, um, uh, of an extended sentence. Um, it, it is open to them to choose whether they engage with services or not while well, they're in prison. Um, they can't be compelled to. Um, but what I'm also conscious of, and as the committee's raised with me before, is to make make sure that we've got these programmes readily available uh, and uh, uh, prisoners who do want to engage with them and are encouraged to do so, uh, that, that they are able to participate in these programmes. Um, so and that's an area of work which I know the Scottish Prison Service are taking forward just now off the back of the inquiry which the committee undertook in 2013 um, into some of this issue. So... Um, uh, uh, you know, we are removing the fact that the automatic element is gone uh, at two thirds, which means that these prisoners now will have to, if they want parole release at an earlier stage, will have to participate in programmes to address their offending behaviour. And, and perhaps finally, if I may, is it on the same issue? Or no, I was going to talk about just, resources. Just so before we... you move on to that, yeah. uh, when when we had the SPS on one occasion in front of us, I think Colin McConnell made the point that prison officers. It shouldn't just stop the interaction with prison officers when the prisoner leaves and goes out of prison. But he had a, a, a view that prison officers would have a role outside, just as social work would have a role inside, so that there was a it, more of a melding rather than you know a sudden break. Is that something that's been discussed? If you've got somebody on a program in the prison and then it continues outside, is there discuss, are there discussions with the SPS about the role of prison officers following that prisoner and also vice versa, social work, whatever, following being within the prison? Well, it's not only been discussed, some of it's already happening. 
Uh, so, for example, if you go to um, uh, a, a, a tomorrow's women in Glasgow, um, we have uh, prison officer staff in the team in the community. So they are dealing with uh, women who have already uh, been in the prison estate, who are back into the community. So you've got prison officers sitting alongside uh, uh, housing officials, okay. health officials, social work officials, uh, and uh, with, uh, with the police all working to help to create sustainable approaches to support these women back into the community. So uh, it's already happening. Uh, there is certainly more we can do in that area. Um, there's no doubt that the prison officers recognise that their role is changing. Some of the work we're looking at just now with the remodelling uh, of the female prison estate and taking a different approach, we'll be looking at prison officers working in an entirely different environment from what they're working in just now with female offenders, uh, which will be much more community-based and much more part of a multidisciplinary team uh, and working with uh, uh, with uh, female offenders. So, yes, in elements it's already happening. Will more of it happen in the future? Certainly in the way I believe things have to move. Thank you. Sorry, Alison. Thank you. Um, Really, just quickly, um, to move on to resourcing, obviously, for this to be effective, criminal justice, social work services in particular, need to be adequately resourced. Can you tell the committee um, what consideration you've given to these changes to the bill as it's moved forward? So, we, in response to the recommendation that came from the committee, we've set out um, a range of uh, figures that uh, indicate what the additional cost would be to these amendments, uh, to the prison estate and to the uh, social work and also to uh, the pro board and the other agencies that would be involved in that over uh, what would be between, uh, just say for example, for the bill come into force in 2016-17, uh, right up till uh, it being uh, it, it fully realised, which would be in 2030-31. Uh, so we've set out the cost and everything, and we have been quite clear is that any additional costs associated with this, that we will meet those costs. Having said that, though, as I've uh, I think mentioned to the committee in at least one, if not more occasions now, is that uh, there is far too much of a resource within the criminal justice system caught up in dealing with short-term offenders who are in and out of our prisons on a constant basis. And if we want to free up the resource within our prisons to be much more effective in dealing with long-term offenders, those that pose the greatest risk to our communities, then we need to make sure that we are being much more intelligent about how we use our prison estate. Um, as uh, the McLeish Commission set out, it has to be used for those who pose the greatest risk to our community in a much more effective way. So I want to uh, look at taking measures that will help to reduce that demand on the front end of our prisons, not just to release resource that can be better utilised within the prison estate itself, but also so that we can utilise that resource within the community setting much more effectively um, as well. But that will take time. And we need to reset that balance. And some of the work that, for example, mentioned around the female prison estate that we're looking about, also for the male estate as well, uh, are dealing with male uh, offenders, is about trying to make sure that we use prison much more effectively for those who pose the greatest risk and that we are using alternative disposals much more effectively for those short-term offenders uh, that could either be diverted from prison or uh, could serve their sentence in a much better and more appropriate way. Uh, which is uh, doesn't have the same resource intensity that we have within the prison estate. Thank you, convener. Yeah, can I just ask first of all, is this Rod? Does this follow on from this? Because I've got I've got John wanting a supplementary to that, and Gil wanting a supplementary. No, no, I'm happy to wait. Rod, yeah. uh, Gil, uh, John, sorry, then uh, Gil. Thank you, convener. Uh, morning, cabinet secretary. Morning, cabinet secretary. Uh, I mean, I understand it is a manifesto commitment, and you're prepared to put the money up to 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 reach that. And the figures we have are that it's going to be 16.724 million 2030-31. Now, the balance about, the, which is more than half the present budget for community, um, dispo, uh, community justice, which is 31.8 million at the moment, are you able to give a projection? Because I know that you talk about only having the people who are posing a, a risk being in prison, but I mean, there must be some projection that can offset that ultimate sum of um, those we are going to imprison if were this legislation to go through or keep in prison longer? Well, um, the figures are based on the assumptions of just what's provided for within this bill. Okay, So these figures are purely to do with this piece of legislation. 
What it doesn't take account of are the other changes that we introduce into the system. So, for example, uh, uh, presumption against short sentences, the uh, greater use of alternatives to custody, change in, changes in sentencing practice um, as well, which uh, the, the Scottish Sentencing Council will help us to address, uh, looking at using, as I say, alternatives to uh, the traditional custodial estate um, as well um, as a, a form of custody. There's a whole variety of things. Uh, that these figures don't take into account because they are purely to do with this piece of legislation. Now, if I can just give you an example, uh, a practical example of where we are just now, Pomit Young Offenders Institution is almost sitting at half capacity. Why is it sitting at half capacity? Because we are now much more effectively dealing with young offenders through diversions and alternatives to custody. Will that start to feed into the adult prison population? I believe it will, um, and it will lead to a progressive change within our estate. There's other things we can do to help to exhilarate that further. We're prepared to do that and looking at how we can take that uh, forward. So I, I think it would, be, it would be overly simplistic just to think, given the figures that we've set out here, is that that will just be an additional cost that we will have to uh, put additional money in to meet. With the other changes that we take forward in the system, I believe that we'll actually free up some of that resource that can be better used, not only to deliver the programmes for those long-term offenders, but also to deliver more effective community disposals as well. What I can't do is I can't just switch things off just now. I can't switch off the resource to the prison estate just now because it obviously requires it. And I also want to see an expansion, an increasing amount taking place within the community uh, with community disposals and alternatives, but within, within a period of uh, financial restriction. So I have to try and find a way in which to balance that. And some of, for example, the redesign work we're looking to do around the whole prison estate stuff is to look at how we can release some of that resource so it can be used in a more imaginative way as well. Well, I'd certainly be supportive of that and probably didn't express my question properly then. Is there any way that you can sort? Because maybe ultimately, I mean, are we going to end up not requiring Pullman, for instance? Are there any implications that would ultimately reduce that top line figure? Because, you know, we have representations from people like the Howard League who are saying, you know, we're told the direction of travel is to reduce the prison population. But here we have ultimately this sum that's more than it's represents more than half the current sum for community disposals. Can I say, I was a wee bit surprised at the Hurl League's comments uh, because it was looking at things in isolation. Uh, it was looking at it purely in terms of but this... With respect, list. is that not what you're doing when you say we're only looking at this aspect of the bill too? No, that's what I'm saying, but, yeah. but their comments were based on that. The other aspects of what we're taking forward within uh, penal policy are about addressing, reducing the number of prisoners we have within our prison system as well. For example, the stuff we're doing around uh, women offenders is about reducing the number of women we have within our prison estate as well. So I think it's, it, you have to look at it in the whole run isolation. But these figures were produced purely for the purposes of this bill in order to give the illustration is that if you did nothing else and just introduced this bill, this is what the implications potentially would be. But we're not doing nothing else. No. But, uh, uh, is it on the horizon then that would be figures that would offset that cost then? I mean, uh, what sort of time frame are we talking about? It, well, it's very difficult because even the figures in here are assumptions. Uh, they are based on uh, existing sentencing practices. They are based on uh, the uh, ongoing rates at the present time uh, for offending behaviour. If that changes, then uh, that will alter as well. So they are assumptions. And the prison estate have to work on the basis of assumptions all the time around a whole range of variables that they don't control uh, about what the demand may actually be on the system. So, uh, you know, it's difficult to say, look, by this date, the prison numbers will be at this level uh, for certain because there are so many variables in there. What I think we can do is, as I've mentioned a number of occasions, is to make sure the way in which we're taking forward these areas of policy, if we do so in a much more integrated way. So uh, the uh, stuff we're doing around uh, uh, provisions around uh, community alternatives, diversions, uh, how we can make sure that that's much more closely linked in uh, with the way in which we're also pursuing policy uh, within the prison estate as well in terms of how we utilise resource and how we actually then apportion resource to meet these different demands. So, um, I, you know, I'm hesitating to start getting into arbitrary figures because the reality is in this area there are so many different variables that it's very challenging to come up with that specific figure that would hold to be accurate in the long term. 
Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Craig. Okay. Uh, along the similar lines. Uh, Good morning, panel. Uh, in the event of early release at the present time, uh, we've got housing, social work services, welfare and benefits, and other things that, that, that happens now. That's been budgeted for. It's not your budget, I may say, but it's somebody else's budget. It's taxpayers' money. And, and looking at your tables, there's no reference to that. And for, for, the, for, for us to get a, 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 a picture of the real costs, we can see additional costs uh, for the prison service, etc. But if people are now not in the community, and that's what this provision will mean, they're not in the community and money being spent there, they'll be in prison. The money won't be spent in the community. And I wondered if you have any figures in relation to that uh, and all these other provisions that, that won't be happening, but they will be undertaken in the prison. Um, the challenge for us in being able to provide those figures is because uh, the figures we can provide for the uh, uh, prison service and also, for example, criminal justice social work is because these are pretty much fixed costs that we can identify. Um, for individuals who are in the community, it depends on what their status was at that particular mm -hmm. point so, and what services they were engaged with. So we don't have that same sort of general fixed cost. If you were asking me about um, alternative disposals it, against a custodial disposal, um, we all know that the, the cost of community provision is much lower, significantly lower than it is to, to deliver things within uh, the, uh, the prison estate. But because there are so many variables for an individual, their own individual circumstance before they end up in prison, it's very difficult to estimate what those costs would actually be. The, the point, actually, some of the figures are quite significant uh, when you when you add them up. You know, like provision for housing, and it will be uh, local authorities that will need to do that part of the job. You've got social work, local authorities again, and then you've got benefits, and it's, these are reserve matters. But it's just to get the idea that, you know, when we want to make change and people just see costs going in, but there's, it's not the real cost. We, we know that for the prison service, yes, of course it is, but the real cost isn't the same yeah. because there are, I, I hate to use the word savings, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know it's, it's offsetting is the, the, right, the, the right word. I think uh, it would be, be worthwhile looking at that. To sell to sell this program to the to the wider public actually because it's not the old cost that we've been given here. Yeah, I think it, it starts to become a bit artificial in terms of the actual costs of it. But it, there is an element where um, it is um, it, there is an offset cost uh, that's associated with someone in the community who may not be in touch with criminal justice social work if they're getting a housing benefit etc. Whatever sort of idea. However. Having said that, because the variables are such for individual circumstances, it's very, very difficult to, to come up with uh, clear figures on that because uh, with the prison estate and others, we've got fixed costs that we can clearly identify how much it costs an individual. But as I say, I think it's it would be overly simplistic just to look at the £17 million and think that's what the additional cost is going to be. That's the additional cost if, when you don't take the offset into account that you've mentioned, but also if we did nothing else in the system, that's simply not the case. Um, uh, and that's why I was a wee bit surprised that the, the her league's uh, view in the matter. Okay, thanks for that. Thank you. Rod. Uh, thank you. Convener, morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, I've got one small question before I move on to my main question, but small question just on the, the six-month period, the uh, mandatory period of supervision. Um, some critics have suggested at the moment we have a proportionate um, way of uh, dealing with automatic early release. Moving to a six-month period, you will lose that proportionality and therefore distort sentencing. How do you come, what would you comment on that? Uh, I'm not entirely sure that automatic release at yeah, it, 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 two-thirds is proportionate because it's, that's it, it's two-thirds. The parole board don't have any control over it. What I think is proportionate is parole release. Uh, the parole board, in considering a case where someone applies for release, can determine whether they think they are suitable for release at that particular point, uh, given their circumstances, what programmes have been through, etc. So I would see parole release as being proportionate. I don't see automatic early release uh, as being uh, proportionate. And the six-month period is uh, in order to make sure that we reduce the risk of someone reintegrating back into the community. 
in order to help to support them because we know there are particular risks when a long-term prisoner is moving back into a community. Particularly that, as is mentioned, that's a 6 to 12 week period in getting them re-established and the six month period will allow that to happen and to take forward any additional measures that are necessary to help to support the individual in, in getting back into uh, uh, the community setting. So um, uh, I don't view automatic early release at two thirds as being proportionate. Okay, thank you. Um, on the 20th of January, we heard from John Watt of the Parole Board in relation to figures that, and what he said was that it's clear that those who are released on non-parole licence at, two, at two-thirds of the way through their sentence and without an assessment of risk tend to be recalled in significantly greater numbers than those who are released on parole licence where there is an assessment of risk. Um, you subsequently gave evidence on the 3rd of March and... and uh, uh, obviously, that evidence is incorporated in the uh, amended financial memorandum at uh, paragraph uh, 34 in particular. But we've also had evidence more recently from Dr Monica Barry, which indicates that those released automatically pose less risk than those uh, released by the parole board. How would you, uh, what would you say to that? Um, I haven't uh, saw Monica Barry's research in itself, so I can't I can't comment on that in great detail. Uh, uh, and although uh, it, it would appear to suggest it, that uh, that the pro release is less effective uh, than automatic early release, uh, which I'd be somewhat surprised at, and would suggest that the pro board, um, uh, uh, in some ways, uh, are almost making things worse. Uh, which, again, I would be surprised if that's the case. Um, but as I say, I haven't saw the, the research in detail, so I can't comment on it in great depth. And uh, it may be that once we've had an opportunity to look at it, we can consider these issues in greater depth. But I gave evidence uh, 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 and at the committee the last time, as you mentioned. We looked at, for example, the figures for 2012-13. There were uh, 476 prisoners who were subject to supervision in the community after parole release, and there were 403 who were subject to supervision in the community after non-parole release. Uh, the rate at which uh, non-parole release prisoners breached their licence conditions was 37%, compared to 5.5% for parole release uh, prisoners. Uh, so someone's uh, effectively seven times more likely to breach their licensing conditions if they receive a uh, non-parole uh, release. And uh, in terms of recall, uh, in that year, uh, you were five times more likely to be recalled uh, for breach of your licence uh, to prison um, if you uh, were automatically released rather than parole released as well. So those figures in that year give a clear illustration of the of the difference. And obviously you've heard some other witnesses make reference to uh, the differences as well. Okay, thank you for that, Cabinet Secretary. So at the very least, looking at uh, Mr Watt's evidence, uh, uh, that as far as recall to custody is concerned, both yourself and the parole board seem to be taking a different view to Dr Barry. Well, we are, as I say, I'm, I'm, I'm yeah. a wee bit... I've only saw the headline figures yeah. idea, so I'm a wee bit surprised because it would seem to suggest that the parole board may... The matter worse, which um, uh, I think most people would be surprised at, given the level of detail and consideration they give to prisoners prior to release. So, um, uh, but the figures for 2012-13, uh, um, I think, give a good illustration of the difference in the course of a uh, over the course of a year. Thank you. I just I, I'm getting a bit muddled here. So, the six months is uh, compulsory. You do, that's at the part of your sentence, the six months. And it's on licence. There'll be conditions attached to that licence. So if you breach them, you're back in prison, I take it. You'll be recalled. Just to make it plain to you. And me. the conditions will be set by the parole board as well. Right. So what's the difference between that and parole? Uh, well, it's very similar to it. Uh, and the person receiving parole release. Uh, and that they would consider what measures they think have to be put in place. So, for example... If you, you can apply for pro f uh, after seven and a half of your sentence. Okay. Uh, and, uh, uh, and the reality is the vast majority of prisoners, uh, uh, long-term prisoners, uh, uh, will receive a pro release. Uh, but in order to achieve that, there are certain things that prisoners have to go through uh, before the parole board will come to a determination on where they think you're fit for pro. And then when they do uh, uh, allow you to pro, they set the conditions. Um, uh, 
the difference with the six month period is to help to support the reintegration. So back into the community, but alongside that, there will also be the conditions that the Pro Board can set uh, in order to help to support your reintegration into the community. And you haven't got the option of serving your entire sentence and coming out scot-free, as it were, with no conditions. No, for the very reason that the okay. committee highlighted in I'm its report, it because of the risks associated with that. So it's a six-month, whoever you are, if you've not got parole, you're coming out after six months, but you're you're still serving a prison sentence, but under supervision out in the community. You're coming out at the end of six, six months prior to the end of your sentence. Yes. Aye, not no, after six months. No, no, you're coming out. The <laughs> so, six months is part of your sentence. Yes, it's no, part of your sentence for... Yeah. It, for, to address the risks of someone coming okay, back into yes, the community. Yes, I understand now. So you're coming out, you've not finished your sentence, this is still your sentence, but you're serving those six months in the community. You do not have an option and say, I'm just going to stay in prison for the next six yes. months. And then it can come out and it won't matter. And the reason it's within the sentence okay. is because that creates a legal provision where the yeah, parole board um, can set conditions. If yeah. you don't do it within their sentence then you don't have that authority to do that. Yeah, so, it's, so it's making sure that it's they mandatory. do something that reintegrate. Re yes, it's yeah, mandatory. I do understand it. I know it doesn't sound like it, but I do. Uh, at least I think I do. Um, Roddy, are you finished? Yeah, happy to. Leave Elaine? Yep. Well, that was my first question answered. Nice. <laughs> well, move, move on. Um, in terms of the demand for prisoner programmes, the financial memorandum only puts a cost of 171,000 by 2030-31, and it also only uh, kicking in uh, in 2019-20 at a cost of 43,000. Is it not possible that under the new regime that prison, there might be a greater demand for prisoner programmes, particularly if prisoners think that that will then make them more likely to get parole? Uh, and are these are these sums really sufficient? I mean, I. A question I haven't got the answer with me that uh, my colleague Graham Pearson posed some time back indicated certainly about around sex offenders there were something like 100 I believe uh, who had been assessed as would have benefited from the sex offender programme but who are not actually on it at the moment. Um, is it not possible because of the changes that we would actually need to front load the prisoner programme uh, provision in order to ensure they're not for example ECHR uh, issues because people haven't been able to access yeah. programmes? Yeah. No, um, uh, these figures are assumptions uh, based on uh, a snapshot here and now as to the implications of this. And the, I think the SPS and their evidence to you indicated they were expecting an increasing demand mm -hmm. for uh, prisoners to participate in programmes as a result of the ending of automatic early release. So um, one of the pieces of work that they are doing already uh, is they've had their purposeful activity review Part of that review has identified issues around access to certain types of courses and also around psychological uh, service provision, and they're about to commission some work uh, to look at taking these matters forward. Uh, the biggest challenge that we have within the prison estate is that there is so much, as I've mentioned earlier on, of the resources tied up in dealing with the churn of mm. short-term offenders. Now, uh, the... Uh, you know, the prison service, like any other public service, have to live within the budget that they have, uh, and during this period of austerity, uh, that has uh, grown ever tighter. Uh, and they have to try and make sure they can deliver as many effective programmes as they can uh, within uh, their budget at the present time. My view is that if we can release some of the resource that's tied up uh, in, as I say, significant amount of resource that's tied up in dealing with a lot of uh, those shorter term offenders, then that will help to release some of the resource that will allow us to expand and develop some of the programmes within the prison estate. So there's a balance to be struck there in trying to achieve that. Um, uh, so, uh, but these figures are based on uh, assumptions um, that could vary uh, 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 in year and across several years, but it's based on the present figures. I mean, I hear what you're saying about short-term uh, prisoners, but actually at any one time, it's only about 10% of the prison population, which are actually the short-term prisoners because they're coming in and out and the longer-term prisoners are there for, for longer periods of time. So, even if we could deal with that situation, now they're probably not getting as much of the sort of prison programmes either if they're only there for short periods of time. So, you know, would that actually address the, the balance if we can, are, can deal are, with that? It's a, it's a smaller proportion on a given day, mm. 
but over the course of a year, oh, it's, yeah, it's thousands. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's thousands of prisoners in and out of the system. Mm. So it's a big, big, big turnover. So, um, and we shouldn't underestimate the amount of resource that the Scottish prison service have to dedicate to just managing that. Um, so, uh, and that's why we need to be much more effective in dealing with that in order to make sure the resource, as Henry McLeish said in his commission, is that we need to make sure we're using it in a much more effective way and much more targeted at those who pose the greatest risk to our community. But there's a lot of the resource is still tied up on those who pose the lowest risk, uh, which then means that we don't have the same level of resource that we may wish to have uh, to help to support those who uh, would pose the greatest risk. That's not to say there's not a lot being done in that area, but could we do more? Of course we could do more. Um, and we could use the resource much more intelligently and much more effectively mm -hmm. if we had less of that churn of short-term prisoners. Mm -hmm. So you know, if the SPS review, which you refer to in the revised memorandum, if that actually comes up with a significant in increase in, in the need of, you know, need of either provision of programmes or psychology provision as well, which obviously is pretty important, if that actually indicates that there is a considerably greater need than we are able to provide for at the moment? Will the resources be there for it? Well, if there are additional resource uh, demands uh, at some point in the future, mm -hmm. then we'll have to look at it then, yes, and to try and address that as effectively <coughs> as we can um, uh, in order to make sure that they can deliver the programmes that are necessary. Uh, uh, so, yeah, I'm, you know, this is potentially years mm -hmm. in advance, so I could be making a commitment just now that mm -hmm. someone else may have to live with, but I... Uh, I'm, I'm certainly committed to making sure that we try to provide the resource that's necessary for the SPS to do their job as effectively as possible. Right. Um, Christian, please. Good morning. Um, just first of all, to go back to the aim of the, of the bill uh, where it was not brought uh, before us, it was talked about public safety and making sure that uh, uh, the, uh, the long-term offenders will... Uh, Will be uh, will not be released and called release as we we, we learn about the called release uh, proposal, which which was very often in the prison system the case where people were released and called release and there were a, a, a justification uh, that it, it needed to be changed uh, for for the, for the protection of the public and particularly the Scottish uh, Association for the Care and Resettlement of Offenders SACRO talked about this about the balancing act and making sure that we talk about public protection. But we did say that uh, the period, the, 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 the mandatory period, could be only three months. Uh, but it would maybe make more sense to have a, a smaller uh, m m military period to make it maybe easier and uh, to focus maybe the offenders, long-term offenders who don't want to, uh, to, uh, to engage uh, focus them on this three month time to be to make sure that we do engage and so it, it, it makes sense maybe in their ways and I, I do agree with them that a smaller period will maybe focus the minds. The um, evidence that I think you heard from SACO um, will be largely around uh, that six to twelve week period that is often considered to be key for a prisoner going back into the community where there are significant risks in managing those uh, matters. And the reason that we've uh, tried to strike the balance is because you've also heard evidence where some would say it should be a year. There are also some of those who say it should be completely proportionate to the length of sentence that you serve as well, um, uh, which I don't agree with, but that's, a, that's another view. We've tried to strike a balance. And the reason I, I think six months is, uh, is an appropriate balance is because there will be some of those prisoners where the three-month period might be sufficient, uh, but there will also be those prisoners where it, it may not be uh, sufficient, and it's to give a level of latitude there and scope, uh, which uh, will hopefully address those where the three-month period may not be sufficient uh, in order to address matters when they move into the community. So... Having listened to the evidence that you've received as a committee, the views that have been expressed in this matter, uh, and considering what is a reasonable timescale to deal with these matters, um, uh, uh, six months is our preferred option, which should help to address, which I believe will be sufficient to address uh, uh, the, the vast majority of prisoners for their period of reintegration back into the community. I understand it's a judgment court just now, but because you know it's not going to be implemented before 2019, really, 
uh, there were plenty of time to prepare for this. And maybe Sacro, you know, maybe you, you would have, we would have thought that would have, uh, we would have concentrated the mind and the services to make sure that we would be uh, uh, effective in a period of three months instead of six. It, it could be that, you know, in, in time people will say that, uh, you know, the six-month period could be shortened. I think part of, you know, what's extremely important here is uh, when a prisoner's been released is that it's not all dependent on just that six-month period. It's the preparatory work that takes place within prison that's extremely important as well for planning around these matters. So, for example, we know the issues around housing uh, can prove to be a real deal-breaker, if you like, in the effectiveness of a prisoner moving back into the community and sustaining themselves there. So some of the work we're doing in Perth just now is that partnership between housing and the prison service to look how we can manage that more effectively. The uh, offender uh, reintegration at ministerial task force that I head up is about trying to make sure from health to housing to, to the whole range of other services are working in a much more joined up and coordinated fashion. The second provision within this bill is informed part by that, about having that flexibility on days of release in order to help to uh, uh, support the reintegration of a prisoner back into the community. So, uh, you know, it's in all of our interests that if a prisoner has served their uh, punishment in prison, that we also make sure that we do everything possible to reduce the risk of that individual com committing further offences. And the reintegration element of it is a key part of it. That's well as the reintegration plans that start uh, prior to a prisoner moving back into the community to look at getting things in place and planned in place prior to them being liberated from prison. And this six-month mandatory supervision period gives us the added security of being able to recall them if we feel uh, that their uh, behaviour is unacceptable, but also to give a clear focus in on the type of support that's necessary during that period. And my last question, because of this six-month mandatory period and because of the way it be delivered with the power of ball, uh, involvement, can you say, Cabin Secretary, that you have removed the word automatic from automatic early release? Well, the principal reason for the bill in itself was to uh, was to end that automatic right to air release at two thirds of a sentence, and that's what the bill achieves. What we are doing is making creating provision for that that a uh, mandatory period of supervision within the community to help to support the reintegration into the community. So that's a, a mandatory period, which, as the conveners correctly point out, it's not optional; they will have to complete. Uh, and because there's no automatic element to that. The, 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 the long title of the bill needs to reflect that. Thank you, Commissioner. Gil. Yeah, it's covered right here at the start with Alison. Uh, John. Mine's, mine's the point. Point. Thank you, Commissioner. Thanks very much. Yeah. Finally, um, Cameron Secretary. Well, not finally. Oh, sorry, 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 Commissioner. Sorry. <laughs> I, I wondered what sort of discussions there's been with COSL about the implications for local government about these changes. Well, the uh, discussions we're having with COSL just now is around the Community Justice Bill and the reshaping of uh, uh, community justice uh, and the creation of Community Justice Scotland. And part of that will see significant reform in the way in which we deliver uh, community justice provision in the future. Uh, and uh, the impact of this bill will be part of that, that overall approach. Fantastic. I didn't have another question. He was being wicked. awkward. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not known for being wicked. Can I thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary, for your evidence and uh, say to members that we'll take further evidence in the amendments from Professor Fergus McNeil and Professor Dr Cyrus Tata tomorrow morning from 10.30, 10.30, all right, and then consider the amendments, the formal amendments, on the 2nd of June. Thank you very much. I now suspend for... Do you want a five minute break for straight on? The suspense is <laughs>
we go to item three. Inquiries into fatal accidents and sudden death, Scotland Bill. And uh, we've got evidence today from two panels of witnesses. And I welcome our first panel, Leslie Thompson, Solicitor General for Scotland. Good morning. And Stephen McGowan, Procurator Fiscal, Major Crime Fatalities Investigation, Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. You've got a longer title, <laughs> I'll <laughs> tell you. <laughs> Thank you very much. And I'll go straight to questions from members. I've got John and then I've got Roddy so far. And then I've got Jane. Thank you. And then Elaine. Thank you, Kavina. Good morning, panel. Uh, Ms Thompson, the, the question of... We, we, in a lot of the evidence we've heard, there's been a lot of reference to family interests. And I would ask it, first and foremost, I mean, families take very varied forms nowadays. There's extended families, there's different... Uh, who is the family that you would bear in mind when you're making decisions? And can you also comment on the balance between the family interest and public interest, please? In relation to the family, we take a wide interpretation of families. We've uh, learned over the years that you can't be restrictive about this. And in many families, there will be groups that, for example, we would require to meet with separately and provide information to separately. So although there is, in general, in life, what's understood by a traditional family group, we don't apply that in-house. And we find on many occasions there are families with different views, etc., as to how much information they want, the way they want that information, and ultimately, at a fatal accident inquiry, whether they're going to attend or whether they want to get their information via the Crown. And, and regarding the public interest, what, what takes precedence? It's not so much... Are you asking me if the family interest takes precedence over the public interest? Yes, yes indeed. Right. The family interest is part of the public interest and no decision is made in relation to whether or not there's going to be an inquiry without having the views of the family taken on board. But if, if the family said no, but the public interest was compelling... Yes, there would be a fatal accident right. inquiry. Okay, we, and and that, that situation does happen, and that can be difficult, to, just as difficult to explain to families as not to have an inquiry for families who wish to have one. Yes, indeed. We, we, we've just received a, a, a late communication from um, Mr Marshall, the president of the Solicitor Advocates, where he talks about the different aspects of public interest. He talks about uh, the public interest in the enforcement of the criminal law by prosecution, and the public interest in lessons being learned from the for the future by holding an FEI. Can you comment on that? Is it tensions or is it...? No, there's not tensions. There's different decisions at different points. The public interest encompasses all these things at different times and in relation to the public interest in ensuring that someone who has been involved in criminality is brought to a court for that is the public interest which takes precedence at that stage. That's why if there are criminal proceedings it's not always an immediate decision as to whether or not there should be a further inquiry because you're looking at different aspects and I think the example you, you set there which we all have at the forefront of our minds are what lessons can be learned. I can I ask about the, where the public interest... There's a, there's a lot of work taking place in the background by, by the very nature of it being confidential, the public are never going to be aware of, but where there's a compelling public interest about a, an issue, say of public safety, we'll say, for instance, how would the public kept advised of that without compromising any procedures? While the investigation is ongoing... Yes, indeed. If there were compelling issues while the investigation was ongoing, the Crown would feel bound to share those with various authorities so that steps could be taken. And it's not unusual during an investigation for remedial steps to be taken. And you may, at the start of looking at something, think this is a matter which will need to be inquired into in public by a fatal accident inquiry. And by the time all investigations, reviews and remedial actions have been taken, there's nothing left that requires to go into the public domain for further public scrutiny. And these remedial steps would be advised to the public as and when they happened? I don't... Th can I perhaps um, uh, assist yeah. in relation to that? This is a, a regular occurrence, and so um, the Health and Safety Executive for Accident Investigation Branches and bodies of that nature regularly during the course of investigations um, will put out material in relation to public safety in order that the public safety aspects can be taken 
into account quickly. So remedial steps like that are taken. We've also got uh, an arrangement with Healthcare Improvement Scotland where a similar uh, things can be done in the medical sphere. So whilst a criminal inquiry may be going, steps can be taken immediately um, if there's a particular issue uh, of public safety that needs to be addressed at that stage. And that's a fairly routine step and, and happens regularly in the types of case I've described. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. I can't recall, John, on the issue of the family, whether you asked as a supplementary, as the bill stands, if there's not going to be an FAI, if a request is made by certain parties, why it's not happening, um, the Crown is obliged to respond and say why there's not an FAI. Do you think that should be automatic? In relation to putting into the public domain reasons why there's not an FAI? Uh, I'm looking at the reasons, uh, Section 8, reasons not to hold an FAI. Uh, reasons decided not to hold a spouse or civil partner has made a request that a person living is married, a nearest known relative. Um, it's basically the relatives being able to ask why you're not holding an FAI. I don't think it's a public issue necessarily. Whether they then went public is another matter. But, you know, whether that should be automatic rather than if you're not going to hold one, just to tell people why not rather than for them to request. Because there may be, for reasons, there may be no state to ask for it, may, may be unsure of things, may not be unaware of the rights under law. I, I don't have any difficulty with that at all. So you're not and, unhappy and in, it was automatic? In practice at the moment, we do provide uh, those reasons. We have been looking at other ways in uh -huh. which we can ensure families are continually This is in writing, which would be different. In writing, yes. So you, do, but, so you have no problem with that being automatic. If you're not going to hold one, you just tell relatives. Yes, that, that have been to and, and, and in practice, that's what happens. Yes. So we don't need to have a, uh, that section when it's got to be requested. I don't think it needs to be requested, no. no. no we which is what the we bill says at the we moment. Would, we would do it automatically. And yes. we would do it automatically, potentially to a wider group of people than the bill suggests, as the Solicitor General described, yes. the dynamics of the family. We, we would potentially yes, but the bill actually says group. that it's the Lord must give reasons in writing yes. if requested, yes. but we don't need no. necessary requests. The other thing I was going to ask is, because we, uh, one of my colleagues isn't here, was ch chasing the issue of early hearings. Um, which um, Lord Gill pretty well, um, very convincingly, obviously, swept to the side for various reasons, what is this and so on. Uh, what's your view about early hearings sort of to keep the Crown on its toes? I've uh, been thinking uh, some more about this and I am also of the view that you can't use the court system for those form of hearings because it would be requiring... <coughs> sheriffs to take decisions and control over cases that were never, never going to reach them. But what I think is important and what a lot of people have raised is having a set process in place so that families know what's happening at certain stages and that there is an element of control over that time, time scale. I've asked the uh, Crown Office team in SFIU to look at producing a charter which would go into the public domain, which would indicate the various stages that certain milestones would happen. And in relation to early hearings, I think the equivalent at the investigative stage would be a hearing or a meeting, whatever you want to call it, set by the fiscal at a certain point in time, and what I have in mind at the moment is three months from the date the death is reported, at which point the fiscal would be required to provide certain information to the family about the stage of investigation and the timescale going forward. It wouldn't be, this is, the de this is the decision, but it would be, this is what's done, this is what needs to be done, this is when there'll be the next meeting. It would be open to families if they didn't want to turn up. There's, you know, uh, uh, but I think it's important that the Crown could have that set going forward. We're working on that, and we're going to consult on that sort of milestone charter with the various victims groups and, uh, and a number of the groups that have given evidence. 
and publish that. Yes, would it be possible for, uh, given that going down this road, possible for that to be available before stage three? Let's say I appreciate the time scale, but you know, so that um, the Parliament would have before it some idea of pro progress that had been made by the Crown, your charter or your protocol or something what, like what, that. What, what, what's your date for that? Stage two isn't till after the summer, so we we we, we would hope to even stage two if I could push, but that's we, we maybe would a bit hope of a push. to. Uh, but what I have in mind is that we we have this done by the end of the summer. Well, then it would be handy to have that for stage two when we're yeah. when we're considering amendment yes, procedures. I, I, yes, I can give that useful. undertaking. Thank you very much, Rod. Uh, thank you, Sabrina. Um You've asked one of the questions I was going to ask. Oh, sorry about <laughs> that. Just that to, to John I, had left that particular category. Yeah. Could I uh, move on to the, some of the evidence <laughs> that we heard from representatives of various trade unions? Uh, Mr Tasker, when he gave evidence on the 12th of May, uh, took the view that, uh, that new diseases or exposure to new industrial processes should be subject to a mandatory inquiry. Uh, if we accept for the moment that the bill does not so provide, but provides for a discretionary inquiry. Are you able to give us uh, any advice as to how uh, uh, kind of a, a new disease or a new injury would be approached by the Crown? Um, what reassurance could we have that the discretion would be exercised so that there would be a fatal accident inquiry in relation to some new process? I think the position is that it's exactly the type of situation that, that discretion would be exercised uh, to have an inquiry because there would be public concern about whether either whether it was, was a new type of industry or a new type of disease and the issues surrounding either the new industry or the new disease not having been aired before. So it would fall into the category of erring on the side of discretion to, to hold an inquiry because there hadn't been previous, previous public scrutiny, especially uh, with new industries if there were serious concerns uh, around processes. So I, I don't feel it's the, it's the type of situation where it's necessary to have it in the mandatory category because there are all, there are all sorts of difficulties around, around definition in relation to that, but I can indicate it's exactly the type of situation that would lead to a discretionary FAI. Thank you. Um, we also heard evidence, uh, particularly highlighted by the, the trade union um, witnesses, as to the importance of a kind of statement of fact. Uh, would you like to comment on that? I'm not entirely I, sure what they mean by that. I, I wasn't entirely certain what they meant by that, and I think the example that they gave, if I recall, was in the, the, in the sense that it happened in act, aviation accident investigations. Mm -hmm. I, I think the nervousness that we would have in relation to that is uh, in relation to after a three month period of time, how reliable would those facts necessarily be? Um, beyond saying that an accident has happened, any comment that goes further than that at that stage potentially sets expectations for the investigations as it goes forward or sets public expectation for what happened in a way that might not be helpful. So I, I'm not. I wasn't entirely certain what they envisaged, but if we take the aviation accident, it's a particularly unique set of circumstances in an aviation accident, and to do that of general application to deaths, when the causes may not be known because of the complexities involved, it, it, it seemed to me that that may cause difficulties going down the line in terms of prejudicing the future investigations and prejudging, I think more importantly, where the investigation may lead uh, in its, once it's run its due course. Okay, can, can I add to that, but at the point where a decision has been made to hold a fatal accident inquiry, the Crown's petition now includes the issues which are going to be raised as, as, as opposed to just indicating an inquiry should be held, and also the practice has developed, and I'm going to ensure it, it, it's embedded under the new preliminary hearing system within the Crown, of providing a list of issues at the earliest stage of the inquiry hearing, which will be the preliminary hearing going forward, which all parties can then add to or not, so there's a very clear understanding at the point the FAI starts of all the issues that everybody wants covered. Thank you. Gil, you'd want yeah, a supplementary uh, on that? Yeah, it was to go back to uh, Roddy's question on uh, mandatory uh, FAIs 
on industrial disease. Industrial disease. Yeah, it's just, yes. just a point on that. I, and I, I wondered if you had any views in the likelihood if there was automatic uh, uh, referrals uh, or FAIs, if that would an impact on budgets. And would it affect... We, we know that lots of people who suffer from uh, asbestos-related diseases require legal aid. Would there be a prospect if there was automatic or, or mandatory FAIs for industrial diseases that that would actually de divert because you've got a finite budget uh, in, in justice? Would it divert resources to that and take it away from the need for or, or some prospect of restricting legal aid? Is that possible, or am I? If 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 a industrial diseases were mandatory, yes, it would increase the number of a of FAIs, which uh, and and our a uh, view is it would lead to a large increase in the number of FAIs, and and many would involve repetition of the same issues. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as legal aid is c concerned, that that's not a matter for the crown beyond indicating that if there are more uh, demands on the on the same resource, then. There's, like, there's going to be a, a conflict. An impact, OK. Well, that's simply as that. That's fine. But the reason not told them isn't to do with money, as I understand it, is to do with to have mandatory FAIs into new industrial diseases. It's not to do with the fact that there'll be more impact on your funding. It's to do with whether it's appropriate. Yes, it's to do with whether it's appropriate. And I think when I answered earlier, when we were talking about new yes. industrial diseases or new industrial types of working uh, or industries, rather, it's exactly the sort of situation that we would anticipate there would be discretionary fatal accident yeah, inquiry. Yeah. OK, just to clarify, I've got Jane, then Elaine, then Christian, then Alison, mm. then Gil. Thanks, Convener. Good uh, morning. Um, the committee's here concerns that the current systems for investigating deaths may not be human rights compliant. So I'd like to ask what steps the COPF has t takes at the moment to ensure that our obligations under human rights legislation are met. In relation to the investigation of deaths, there is the Scottish Fatalities Investigation Unit, which is an independent investigative unit within COPFS, that w ensures that all evidence is in gathered, expert reports are prepared mm -hmm. if uh, necessary. Thereafter, if there are issues which require public scrutiny, it will move to a fatal accident inquiry, thus ensuring the two strands of infective investigation and, and public scrutiny, but public scrutiny in public. If there are issues which have been resolved and remedial action taken, then the Crown will wish to ensure that that has been taken forward within the organisation that has taken the action. I think Mr McGowan made reference to the, the work that we've been doing with the NHS to ensure that any practices which are discovered during an investigation are taken forward. And that uh, has the effect of ensuring that the investigation has been effective, has been scrutinised and action has been taken as a result of it. OK, thank you. And... Um do you think that an FAI should be mandatory in the case of looked after children or people who are subject to mental health detention? I think the balance within the legislation is appropriate at the moment. If if you look at mental health detentions there and, and the purpose being of mental health detentions, care of people, not the same public concern about, for example, those who are in, in custody as far as either police or prisons are concerned, where there's an element of punishment as well as an element of care. But if, if, if you look at the purpose for which they're there and the type of persons who will be under that sort of care, there are a large number of natural deaths and it would cause distress to families, I would expect, to have those as mandatory. So what you need to ensure is that there is an effective reporting system so that those deaths are reported to the fiscal. And we've been doing a work 
in relation to ensuring that there is such effective reporting system. Thereafter, an independent investigation by the Lord Advocate, which is independent of all the other organs of state. And if there was also a review or a some form of inquiry, for example, by the Mental Welfare Commission. I think in order to ensure it's human rights compliant, consideration has to be given to making sure all that's in the public domain. If not, then it's a matter of the Lord Advocate to ensure that the investigation and outcome is Article 2 compliant. And if it wasn't covered by any of those other ways, then they would require to a fatal accident inquiry. So that, that ultimately is the, is the final safeguard. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Convener. Can we go back to mandatory inquiries, uh, section two, subsection four, and child required subsection four b, a child required to be kept in secure accommodation or detained in secure accommodation? I posited uh, to the Lord President that if they were not physically within that secure accommodation, but they had been. They were under state care by order of the court um, for their own good or for the good of the public, but they were out and about. Would that apply? Would that particular, it says required to be kept, and have they actually physically got to be in the secure accommodation for that to apply? They, they have to be kept or detained. So within, I, I, that within that? So I, I think anyone who's otherwise with uh, foster carers or elsewhere. No, I didn't mean order. that. I meant the child might have been kept or detained in secure accommodation, but they might be out and about because and are required to come back, as happens. They're not kept in all day long. If they were out and about and something happened, would that section apply? It, it, uh, do you mean out and about as in they've gone to school on a particular yes, day? Yes, they've but gone to school or they've gone forwards? out or, or they've... Uh, they've not come back when they ought to have come back to the secure accommodation. Would that apply? I think it, the, the section talks about the being required to be kept or detained. So I, I, I think arguably it would uh, apply, but it, it may... Even it, if they're not actually physically yeah, within e a building? Even if, even if they've left that day. I, I think, it, I think if to, for there to be absolute clarity then the situation which you describe, where they may be out for the yes, day yes. Uh, at school or, or, or elsewhere it would be helpful potentially just to clarify that in the legislation if that's a legislative intent. So it's not clear. It would have I, to have some other wording. I think you could interpret it that way. Um, but I think that there may be challenges. So yes. in, in order to have absolute clarity, I think you raise a very fair point. Yeah. That it would be better I mean, a, ch to... a child who was there under their own protection kept her, and I had a case that was many, you know, broke out. Uh, and was two days wandering about before they could be retrieved. Now, if something had happened in that period, um, you know, the, it wouldn't. That wouldn't have necessarily. I, I think if they broke out the situation, I think if they broke out, I think I'd be comfortable in interpreting that as the fact that the child should have been in the accommodation. But I can imagine situations yes. where the child was being kept in secure accommodation, but was in mainstream schooling and was travelling to and from uh -huh. uh, mainstream schooling or or, or such like. Uh, that there would be, I think, okay. a shade of grey round about that that okay. may be just, worth clarifying. Just, but if they that. broke out um, and absented themselves from a place... That or a door was kept, left unlocked or something. Yes, I think that... That I would think, be different if the door was left unlocked. I think so, because... And then something befell yes, them. Because they would technically, they should have been in the place yes. to which they were being kept. OK, I just... Well, I might pursue that further. I think it's their status which is important. That's I would like I to think we would interpret it in, yeah. in, in the way you're indicating and if it's necessary to amend the wording to clarify... Yes, that, I thought it, it was their status be, rather yes. than the police, but I thought that was more like the police. Anyway, I'll I, I just press that further. Um, I've got El Elaine followed by Christian. Thank you, uh, Convener. Can I turn to the issue of Sheriff's recommendations? And as you'll be aware... Uh, Patricia Ferguson's proposed Members Bill uh, rec uh, would make uh, compliance legally binding after uh, hearing to discuss any issues, whereas se Section 27 of the Bill requires responses to be made to the Scots Scottish Courts and Tribunals Service. I could I ask for your comments on both of those uh, proposals in terms of Sheriff's recommendations? In relation to Sheriff's recommendations, there are a great deal of difficulties if they were legally binding in the sense that it would 
widen the scope of the inquiry may end up being un unenforceable because the sheriff had been looking at the particular <laughs> circumstances of the death or, or deaths before him and has the danger of turning the inquiry into an adversarial process. I think the, the important thing is that the recommendations are out there in the public domain and that those who are on the receiving end of those recommendations are, are required to say what they've, what they've done about them. We had some evidence from some witnesses who, who felt that SCTS wasn't necessarily the best uh, place for these recommendations, the responses to the recommendations to be published, that um, perhaps that Scottish ministers should have responsibility for doing it, since if the recommendations required legislative change, it would be ministers who were responsible for bringing forward that legislative change. Uh, and that certainly has been suggested by, in a, in a letter from the um, Sheriff's Association, that Scottish ministers could be given the power to bring forward subordinate legislation under the bill to promote compliance, uh, and uh, I just wondered, or others have said that perhaps the Lord Advocate would be the best person to collate the responses. I just wondered, have you a preference in terms of any of these? I, I, I don't have a, a mm -hmm. particular preference beyond uh, reiterating I, after having worked in this mm -hmm. area for many years, think it's extremely important for families who want lessons learned, that those lessons are, are mm -hmm. learned and, mm -hmm. and that recommendations are taken forward because on the occasions where there's not a necessity to have an FEI but there are lessons that have been learned, the Crown take their duty of making sure mm -hmm. that those who need to know do know and if that includes government, it includes government. But, but beyond that, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, mm -hmm. the Crown would assist in whatever method was thought the most appropriate. Okay. What, what can a family do if they're not happy with their results for an inquiry? What's, what's the recourse for families who are not content after an FAI? After an FAI? There's no the, the, their only recourse, I think, would be to judicially, judicially review, review the mm -hmm. decision mm -hmm. uh, of the Sheriff, but that's, that would be in relation to matters of, of, of law think, rather yeah. than no. um, specific facts. I don't think mm -hmm. there's ever so been never, a challenge to the facts. Happened. Mm -hmm. as determined by the Sheriff that um, I can think of. They might bring civil proceedings, mightn't they? The, often there will be civil proceedings yeah. in, in all of these cases in any event. Thanks. OK, I'm going to take Gil, because Christian and Alison have waited a while. I'll take them first, if you don't mind. It's just a wee point on the Sheriff's recommendation. I'm still coming back to you, well, because they've waited thanks. a long time. Okay, Christian, thanks. then Alison, then Gil. Thank you very much for that. And good morning. Uh, regarding Section 6, inquiries into deaths occurring abroad, uh, and particularly uh, uh, and section one, subsection 1. C, the person body has been brought up to Scotland. Uh, do you think that, um, do you see any difficulty? There's been some calls uh, for this to be amended for exceptional circumstances. Um, do you think any difficulties if that had if the bill was going to be amended? Sorry, my hearing is sorry. Yes, it's regarding uh, death occurring abroad. Yeah, right. uh, The requirement to have the body uh, recovered and sent back to Scotland, and there has there has been some calls during uh, this uh, in front of this committee that this amendment will be removed, especially for uh, exceptional circumstances where the body, for a reason or another, obvious reason, cannot be recovered. Uh, do you think if this amendment, uh, an amendment is, 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 is put uh, forward and change the, the bills on that particular point, do you see any difficulties? Can, can I say a, a, a couple of things about uh, the new power to hold inquiries in relation to deaths abroad and there are no powers for the Crown to in investigate those deaths w without cooperation. And, and the reason I'm, I'm mentioning that first is because it then becomes very important to the Crown, the repatriation of the body, because that is evidence and in, in many respects may be the evidence of the, of, the, of the cause of death. And there has been at least one 
occasion in the past where the information that, that came to the Crown was uh, of a cause of death and, and a post-mortem, and, and it could be seen visually from the body that, that no invasive post-mortem had been carried out. That, that's, that's part of our thinking around that, but also it's entirely in line, as I understand it, with what, what, what the cor coroner does. If you're, but nobody likes to have rules where there is then the one exception, wh wh which makes it all a uh, look silly. So I, I wouldn't have any difficulty around a, there being an, you know, exceptional circumstances that would require to be a, justified to allow the, the Lord Advocate to go down that route when there hadn't been repatriation of the body. Thank you very much for that answer. And, and leading off what you, you, you told us about the cooperations with other country uh, jurisdictions and police as well, uh, do you think that the bill could be a bit clearer to, to specify that point that money shouldn't be spent to invest to double up an investigation or to go abroad, sending police officers abroad, for example, uh, to do a job which is, has been done already? Do you think maybe uh, there is a need for, to limit the, the, the remit of the bill on, on, on that point, uh, because uh, there is only 157,250 uh, in the financial memorandum uh, for an assessment of likely cost associated with investing death abroad. If we could see, if we duplicate what uh, another jurisdiction done, you know, there's the summons could could uh, could increase a lot. People are, are are working and living abroad a lot more than they used to. I don't think it requires to be in the bill, these, these sort of limitations. I think in relation to investigation, the Crown are well placed and have a lot of a good relationships with, with a number of other countries in relation to deciding whether or not what, in effect, you would be doing would be duplicating a effort. So I, I don't think that requires to be on the contained within the bill. I'm quite interested about that. You know, in the time meeting just now, we don't send investigators abroad or we don't spend that vast amount of money uh, to see what happened abroad or to check that, you know, what, what, what's the situation just now? Well, we don't have power to send our investigators uh, abroad in, in, in relation to these matters and this legislation doesn't give us that power either. It would be as a result of cooperation with the <coughs> other countries through the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. We have powers in relation to criminal investigations mm -hmm. in order to ingather a evidence under mutual legal assistance. So we have a certain amount of knowledge as to which countries will cooperate quickly, which countries may, may take longer. And in the unusual situation, if there isn't any method of, of cooperation, so we have that experience. So you're quite happy with the financial yes. memorandum. Thank you very much. Thank you. Alison. Thank, Thank you very much, Convener. Uh, Mr Finney spoke to you earlier about the role of families and the importance of of, of their um, feelings and, and, and uh, views on, on the situation. <coughs> and you, you responded fairly positively. And Am I right in um, my understanding that at the moment, if a family... Um, wanted to challenge a decision, um, perhaps around um, whether a death was self-inflicted or accidental, that there's no formal mechanism for the family to do that, to challenge your conclusion on that? Well, apart from a judicial review... Uh... We don't come to any conclusion on whether a death is self-inflicted or not. Um, we would come to the we would come to certain conclusions, but we don't make any determination that there's a death is self-inflicted. What we may come to is an investigation which may reach that point. We may have a discussion with the families about that, and there's a certain statistical return that's put in, but it's not a formal finding that, that we have. I think there was a, uh, a... The Public Petitions Committee had a petition in relation to this matter, uh, and I think I gave evidence in relation to that matter on a previous occasion, but there's no formal finding um, in relation to that by the Crown. Um, there would be come a point at which the Crown says we're, we don't think there's any criminal um, activity there and therefore the assumption would be that it has been accidental or self-inflicted. Um, that would depend very much upon the circumstances of the case because if there was any suspicion that the death may have been homicidal, the case is likely to 
uh, be an unresolved homicide. There are there are some cases which we would treat as unresolved homicide where there's a, a there is no clarity round about the cause of death. So it depends upon the individual death. There are some cases where for statistical purposes we may send a return to the general registrar's office saying um, in the circumstances of this case we suspect this death has been suicidal. Um, there are others which are accidental which wouldn't be part of that return and there are others where there may be a suspicion that the death has in some way been homicidal but the evidence at that point in time doesn't support that. So there are various categories of case. Um, is there a, another category of just unascertained deaths? Yes. Yes, yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. But if you, if, if the family feels that um, there should be further criminal investigation, there is no way for that to be challenged. There's no independent assessment in the system at the moment. The independent assessment is the Lord Advocate and, and the Procurator Fiscal reviewing the police investigation and directing that police investigation. Um, that's the independent review that there is. So you don't see any merit in there being perhaps a sheriff's inquiry where there is that kind of dispute? Is there any parallel with, say, a coroner's inquest, which is used much more frequently down in, in England? I don't see any, any merit in, in that, um, no. It, it, it may well be that there is a fatal accident inquiry in that type of death. So. Sorry, I was just going to add, uh, in-house, we do, a uh, if there has been a request to review circumstances, review in-house with, with different people, and we've done that on a number of occasions. It's still the same organisation, but looking at it with a, f a fresh pair of eyes. And it's akin to the victim's right to review under the uh, new legislation. And, and are you able to explain to me um, the role of coroners in quests and how they operate in, in England and why we haven't followed that system here? <laughs> no. Well, you have no. You, you have no. Views no all on, I, all on I was going to say that. was that, that, that constitutionally we, we just have a completely different mm -hmm. system. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the, the procurator fiscal was here first, so to speak, yeah. and down south there was a corner, <laughs> and th then they had the CPS, so, yeah. uh, no, no, I, I... Scots <laughs> law. <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't... Uh, <laughs> we can sometimes learn from other places. Okay. <laughs> you're yeah. finished, you're yeah. finished. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to take Gil first, because I've parked him, then I'll take you, John. Yes, but apart, so was, so was Gil previous on another point, Yes, I, it's just in Sheriff's re recommendations. And, come and back. I just wondered, is it actually possible for chef, Sheriff's recommendations on a specific point to become compulsory without legislation? Or do recommendations from Sheriff's currently, and is this what we're talking about, actually look at the law as they are and make a recommendation because the law was not carried out properly? Is it? Well, they make a, a, a recommendation usually as to practices that, that could have been changed rather than, than specifically the law because the, the sheriff is looking at the system and any defects of work within, within Section 6 of, of, of the current <coughs> legislation and recommending what, if it had been in place, the death may possibly have been avoided. But, but again, it would be possible for a sheriff, even although uh, the, the need, there was maybe a change in the, in the law required, would a sheriff actually say that, you know, a recommendation, but it is only a recommendation, it's not, you know, it, it's, it's not anything that some, would, some other second or third party would be forced to act on. It's just a recommendation. Without, without, le without legislation. Yeah, OK, that's fine. I'm busy answering. I shouldn't answer you. I'm not, I'm not um, John. Yeah, thank you, Kavira. Uh, Mr McGowan, maybe if you help me just clarify something I, I maybe misunderstood in relation to a response you gave to Ms McInnes, and it was you, you said that if there were any debate, the independence comes in the... Uh, with regard to whether an FBI should proceed, comes that independence comes from the Lord Advocate. I was referring to the situation of the criminal investigation, which um, I think was, was part of the question, that if there's a criminal investigation, where does the independence come in if the family aren't happy about that investigation and where it's, it's come from? In relation to the FAI uh, and a rec or a decision as to whether there's to be an FAI, a discretionary FAI, that's a Lord Advocate, again, independently, and there's a, 
a remedy of judicial review if, if the Lord Advocate decides not to exercise his discretion in favour of having an FAI. But Crime in Scotland is investigated at the behest of the Lord Advocate. Yes. So is there not a conflict between these two? Between having an FAI? Well, well, but, but su suggesting that someone who's saying, um, I'm not going to have an FAI, is also the person that's directed any criminal inquiry that may have also taken place. No, I don't think that there is. I don't think there's any conflict of interest in relation to that, and it comes down to the points that the Solicitor well, General Is independence made the appropriate term, then? Yes, I think it is. I think the, the Lord Advocate independently investigates crime, prosecutes that crime, and investigates death. I think independence is the appropriate term in that regard. It comes back to the Solicitor General's point about all of the factors which make up the public interest, and I don't think you can disaggregate those points and say there's a different public interest in a particular aspect in relation to an FAI or a criminal prosecution or a family's interest. I think those are all factors which, when taken together, are factors which go towards what the public interest actually is. Could I, could I just perhaps indicate that uh, it's how that's done in-house which, which is important and it's done within separate teams of, of specialists and, as I indicated <coughs> earlier, di different aspects of public interest at different stages. So in relation to criminal proceedings, let's say the, the, uh, clearly the, the potential for high court proceedings, at that stage the circumstances will be looked at by the prosecutors, sometimes within the health and safety division, and then to Crown Council for a decision on criminal proceedings. It's not the same group of people that will then consider whether or not a fatal accident inquiry is, is appropriate or what further investigations there should be in relation to a fatal accident inquiry. And although these groups work together, it, it is a separate process and a separate report, and there are two specialist Crown Council now within the team who deal with these deaths type matters. So I think independent is the right is the right word to use, but I think I have to satisfy you that within the one organisation that independence is going on. But ultimately it's still the same person who makes the, the decision. Who has oversight no, of the, both these functions. It's, the, it's invested in the Lord Advocate constitutionally, these two areas. What I'm indicating... There's no personal criticism. No, 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 no I understand, understand that. But understand what process, I'm, and ultimately it's the, the same person who's responsible overall charge of both of these teams. It's the same person who's in overall <clears> charge. <throat> the individual decision-making in relation to these two aspects will be different people within that... D two sets of different yes. considerations. Yes, but someone has to be overall responsible. Yes, yes, yes. 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 Okay, thank you very much. Oh, we've got there. Um, I want to ask about Section 7, as nobody's asked about it. Inquiries into deaths occurring abroad is about service personnel. Now, we've got your letter, uh, which is excellent legal treatise and why at the current, <laughs> the current state of affairs, uh, to somewhat to our surprise, uh, people serving the armed forces are not employees and therefore do not, I presume they can't go to employment tribunals and things like that, nothing like that. Okay, so let's look at section seven because that, that's the status at the moment. The, the lines here can only apply, and it's, it's not a mandatory inquiry here, it's a discretionary one, if the death of the service personnel, occur, service personnel occurs abroad. And one of the subsections says that uh, one of the things is there's a bit about being in custody at subsection two, but then subsection three, which is an alternative, was sudden, suspicious, or unexplained, or occurred in circumstances giving rise to public concern. Why can't we extend that, just not bothering about whether or not there's employee status, to service personnel per se? If it applies to somebody abroad, I don't know why we can't do it for somebody in Scotland, if the same kind of circumstances arise and not even go down the road of whether or not you're an employee and therefore it's mandatory. The, the, the genesis of Section 7 is Section 11A of the, the 1976 Act, which was added in uh, in the last few years to deal with matters abroad. Um, I, I don't 
have the answer to this and it's for Parliament itself. I think there may be legislative competence issues round about that in terms of uh, the military. But Section 7 simply deals with the military. I think the, the issue which the committee discussed at the previous hearing relates simply to whether or not it's mandatory in the UK to have uh, the uh, fatal accident inquiry into the death of service personnel, and it's not. It's discretionary, as it is abroad. So it's discretionary within the UK, but but therefore, just to be, I don't understand this. If somebody is, if service personnel in Scotland, something happens to them that gives rise, notwithstanding perhaps an internal inquiry, gives rise to a suspicion of something not quite right here. Could you hold a FAI? Yes. You could? We could hold one. You could still hold we one? We could hold one, but the point is that it's discretionary rather than mandatory. No, I understand that. I'm, I'm, but we, I'm, there, there is nothing which... which disbars us in any way from holding a fatal accident inquiry. So I'm bothering about nothing really yes. here. It, it would be a mandatory, yes. uh, it would be a discretionary inquiry. Have you held any? Um, I, I can't think off the top of my head of one, uh -huh. um, but, but, but we could. I haven't checked. We can, we, we'll, that is we'll, something we can we'll, check We'll on. check it out. And There's just a kind of a wee info. feeling here that, that there isn't the protection um, to service personnel that there are to other people. I appreciate the, the status that they have from your from your explanation, but just this feeling, and perhaps this isn't the place to deal with it, don't know, we'll ask the Minister. But um, So you're telling me, in any event, if something happens here, Army recruits out training, FAI could be held if there was some, even if there was an internal Army inquiry. Uh, absolutely. Would you get all that material back from the yes, Army? You get yes. absolutely everything. We, we would get that material, and we have done in the past, and the incidents <laughs> I'm thinking of, where we haven't had an inquiry. But yes, we would get all that uh, information okay, from the military. Okay, just I'll find out more about that, because it's still bothering but, me a wee There's bit. nothing which bars us from it, and we have no particular view one way or the other on yeah. any of that. It's, it's simply the law as it stands. So it's just this it's, word it's, mandatory it's, that's it's in whether our way. or not it, there must be the inquiry or whether or not yes. the Lord Advocate has discretion to order one uh, is the point that I was trying to clarify. But one could make it mandatory and not even mention the fact that they're in the, the, it, there could be mandatory inquiries into service personnel whose deaths occur within Scotland, and you're not even treating them as being... It just be a separate section. Nothing to do with being an employee. In, in, in principle, we have no difficulty with that. Yes. I say there's, there's legislative competence issues to explore round and about that, so, which I don't pretend to have yes, the answers to no, today. But in, in, in principle, yeah. there's no difficulty with that. I know, I know. I, saw him, I see him waving. It's all right. You're very helpful. Christian, on the yes, same point. Yeah, just to add, if, if you come back to us to let us know if you had any of the discretionary things, could you come back to us to see if you've been asked... To hold one. Yes, a fool. A fool. Yes, we've been asked to hold one. Yes, we'll, 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 yes, we'll, yeah. Please, thank you. Was that waving at me, or was that wanting to come in? A fond wave, and <laughs> also. I, yeah. It's about time. Yeah. <laughs> I, I just wonder, and I know you'll be uncomfortable discussing cases. There was the tragic loss of life of a young army cadet in the Western Isles. Would that fall into the category, if you recall, or was it? There was an FAI in relation to that case, but that person was not employed um, by the military. So that, that question, that was a discretionary inquiry which came out of different circumstances. We don't need to necessarily bother with the employment status. Um, if we were, I don't know whether we do or not want to do that. Uh, Elaine. just wanted to, uh, you'll probably be aware that Patricia Ferguson's proposed Members Bill uh, would introduce uh, time limits which could be flexible. Uh, for the holding of FAIs. I wondered if you could comment on that and in, in doing so maybe give us some sort of indication because it is uh, a concern that's been raised by families about the sort of average time scales for holding an FAI and if there are particular reasons why there are delays occurring. If, if I could uh, say, first of all, that I share concerns about the length of time that it takes to conclude these sort of investigations and inquiries. And there has been a lot of work done in order to try and shorten those periods without compromise of other things. There are, uh, and I'm going to take some, some time to deal with, with this question, there are a number of issues which impose on the timescale. Firstly, the date that the matter, the death, comes to the attention of the Crown can sometimes occasionally impact on, on time scale if it hasn't been immediately. The 
fact that there may on many occasions have to be the consideration of criminal proceedings. And as I indicated earlier, criminal proceedings will, in the public interest, take precedence over a, a fatal accident inquiry. So that puts time into the length of time. The, th the third aspect is the involvement of other regulatory authorities who have duties to carry out their own investigation and inquiry and are not subject to timescales necessary, but more importantly, are, are not subject to the control of the Crown in relation to the in-gathering of that information in the way that the police are when, when the Crown can instruct the police to uh, carry out inquiries. And, and you'll be aware that I did write last year in order to try and ensure that sort of cooperation from AAIB on uh, the uh, Clutha incident, and the First Minister also had to write. And the fourth aspect is that most fatal accident inquiries will require expert evidence of some sort. Frequently, med medical experts. And it's not for the Crown to set their priorities within their, their own organisation. So in many respects, we are, we are subject to how long before they are going to... A, produce those reports, and I'm not saying that we don't have a good relationship with, with experts, but we do, but that all puts time into a, how long a matter takes. What I indicated earlier was I think it's important that if this legislation controls that time from the point it's decided to have an inquiry, then the Crown have information out there in the form of the charter I indicated to indicate timescales from the point, the internal time scale of, of 12 weeks to make a, a, a decision on a straightforward matter stops until the final decision is made. Mm -hmm. it, it's not... There, the specialists within SFIU over the past three years have been working on the approach of dealing with the older cases and trying to ensure that they didn't uh, compromise more recent cases are working in tandem. It's one of the reasons why there were so many FAIs last year. There were 60 FAIs last year, which is probably double what there had been in the in the previous year, in order to try and bring bring all of that forward. It, it's I mean I I, I share the concern, uh, your concern, the concern of families, and it is something that we are continually actively working on. If if the crown is under pressure with the number of FAIs, do you horrible word? Do you rank them in a priority way? In or that may be that's why I'm looking at to see if that's why some FAIs we may not be as complex, but do involve let's say someone at work. But there's another big FAI. There's this push further down the time scale. I I think that. The, when, we're, when we're looking at these and when you're getting examples of things that haven't been dealt with as, as effectively or as quickly as they should have been in the past, it was either before the SFIU was set up or two years into SFIU, all the cases were project managed so that we can work on the older ones and newer ones to try and compress the time scales and eventually have as a, a an acceptable time scale going forward without ever compromising the effectiveness of the investigation because ultimately that that's what leads to the appropriate appropriate thinking, recommendations. I think I was asking prioritising mm -hmm. FAIs. I can appreciate there would be a circumstance where, for reasons that you really must stop certain things happening, PDQ. Uh, by making certain statements about what's happened, as you've, I think, illustrated earlier, when changes are made, perhaps more in, in, if FAI gets off the ground uh, or during it. How do you prioritise? Because it may be that um, some slip further down, take longer, not because they're complex, because more complex and more urgent ones go further up the pecking order. That's, that's not been the experience in relation to project managing the... FAIs going forward. 
The last one I want to ask, because nobody's asked it, is what, in what circumstances do you think trade unions should be included in the list of those automatically or, uh, allowed to participate in an FAI? What would be the circumstances, and is that what you do? The, because the trade unions put that to us. The, the bill has within it, it being at the sheriff's, sheriff's discretion, if a, a person has an interest... Uh, in the inquiry, and, and I think that, that covers those areas where they would have a, a specific interest. So you, there's no role for the Crown there in, you know, in setting up which you recommend, which witnesses you want to come forward, you bring the, the, for, to, to elicit the evidence in the inquiry. There isn't a circumstance you say, well, we'll have to have somebody from the trade unions there. That would be a matter for the Sheriff. No, it, if, if, if there was a particular set of circumstances where it was important as part of the investigation that information was sought from the trade union, then, then I would expect that to be done. I can't, off, I'll be frank, I can't off the top of my head at the moment think of one. Usually the experience is that the trade union involvement is ensuring representation for certain people who are going to be represented at the, at the inquiry. But I'll leave it at that because it was just one that hadn't been asked. I know it was something the trade unions put. Can I thank you very much for your evidence? I'm going to suspend for five minutes.
Right, we're back. Um, uh, we're now on to our second panel of witnesses, and we have uh, Paul Wheelhouse, Minister for Community Safety and Legal Affairs, and Scottish Government officials Hamish Goodall and Marissa Strutt, both Policy Officers, Civil Law and Legal System Division, and Greg Walker, Sister Directorate for Legal Services. Uh, good, morning. good morning. And I believe you wish to make an opening statement, unlike the Cabinet Secretary. I don't want to put pressure on you, but... Yeah. If, if you're pressed for time, Camilla, we don't no, need no, to. No, 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 no. I wouldn't want to, you know, curtail you there. Just go ahead. That would be helpful. Thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity to address the committee. And it's, it, we believe it's right that the system of fatal accident inquiries was reviewed by Lord Cullen to ensure that it provides an effective and practical system of judicial inquiry into deaths in the public interest and that the legislation should now be updated to be fit for the 21st century. The Dean of the Faculty has given evidence to the committee uh, that he believes that the bill will modernise the system of FEIs. Lord Cullen made 36 recommendations for reform of the FEI system. Some of these uh, were addressed to the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service and have already been implemented by the establishment of the Scottish Fatalities Investigation Unit. A cons consultation was carried out by the Scottish Government on the legislative proposals to build on the changes which have already been made by the Crown Office and to further consider some of the main areas identified as requiring attention. For example, 74% of consultees agreed that the aim of independent investigation into the death of a person subject to compulsory detention by a public authority should be met by independent investigation by the Procurator Fiscal and exercise of the Lord Advocate's discretion on completion of that investigation. 80% of those who responded agreed with Lord Cullen uh, that mandatory timescales for the opening of an FEI are not practical or realistic uh, due to the diversity and complexity of FEIs. And the bill takes forward the principle of Lord Cullen's recommendation for requiring responses to Sheriff's recommendations. The Chief Executive of the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service has acknowledged uh, to the committee that it's logical and transparent that responses to recommendations should be posted on the SCTS website, since Sheriff's recommendations are already available there. Uh, the Scottish Government considers that proposal to be a proportionate and transparent way of ensuring recommendations are taken seriously, uh, which was echoed by the Dean of the Faculty when he said the policy strikes the right balance. Section 26 of the Bill ensures that a Sheriff's determination will be disseminated not only to any person to whom the Sheriff is addressing a recommendation, but also to any person, other person who has, been an interest, has an interest in the recommendation, which will obviously include regulatory, professional and trade bodies. The Bill will also build on Lord Cullen's recommendations implemented by the Crown Office to make the system more efficient, for example by greater use of preliminary hearings and other procedural measures. Uh, the Lord President suggested that as much evidence as possible should be in writing and the Bill provides for the agreement in writing of non-controversial evidence by the participants. It will permit more flexible location and accommodation arrangements for FEIs, which may permit uh, FEIs to take place quicker than waiting for court capacity to become available. It will permit discretionary FEIs into deaths of Scots abroad. It will ensure that FEIs remain inquisitorial fact-finding hearings as set out in section 1, 3 and, and 4 of the, the Bill to which the Lord President drew attention. And it will permit FEIs to be reopened if new evidence arises or if the evidence is so substantial uh, to permit a completely new inquiry to be held. Finally, I'd like to reflect on some aspects of the evidence which the committee has, has heard or received and look forward to seeing your, your own Stage 1 report. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions, convener, uh, that, that the committee may have. Let's hope your happiness continues, <laughs> Minister. Uh, who's, who's going first? I'm looking to my left for a change, but there's no movement over there, so it's Rod. Thank you. And then Christian, then Elaine. And now I'm looking to my left and there's still no movement. Yes, there is. Jane. Right. OK. So we've got four. Uh, Rod, Christian, Elaine and Jean. Thank you. Um, morning, Minister. Could I perhaps just kick off with a question about um, deaths uh, of people who are compulsory detained for mental health reasons? Um, the policy memorandum details the graduated skill of investigations which the Royal College of Psychiatrists operate under uh, paragraphs 116 and 117. We've heard from a large number of witnesses with concerns about the human rights aspect of that and we heard from the Scottish Human Rights Commission and indeed from the Mental Welfare Commission itself that they had concerns that Article 2 requirements are missing from the graduated school of investigations. Um, is there anything that you can add uh, to reassure people about the human rights implications of continuing as we are? Well, it's obviously a really important point. Um, 
such deaths are clearly already subject to, and you mentioned, uh, Rod Campbell mentioned the Mental Welfare Commission and, and others and who, who have a role in this, they're already subject of investigation by the Procurator Fiscal and the Lord Advocate uh, has discretionary power to hold an FEI into such deaths when it's considered to be in the public interest. And as I said in the, my opening remarks, 74 per cent of respondents to the consultation favoured the retention of an investigation by the Procurator Fiscal and the exercise of discretion by the Lord Advocate and completion uh, of the investigation to instruct an FEI if he thinks uh, one is, is, is required. Um, we're aware that the Lord President also uh, agreed that the current discretionary power is sufficient, and he said, and uh, I quote him here, uh, I think that we're in danger of imposing unnecessary rigidity on the system. The system by which the Crown makes investigations and form judgments is, I think, the best model. Um, but I do take on board the serious concerns people have about human rights when someone is uh, taken into a setting which is not a, not a normal setting. We have to remember whether it's uh, in, in a facility such as Carstairs or more commonly in, in a facility which is dealing with their mental health issues, maybe sectioned under the Mental Health Act. Um, there is uh, a, a largely a medical environment there um, in, the, in the latter grouping, and um, uh, you know we, we are satisfied that there are uh, triggers, if you like, for the Mental Wealth Fair Commission to uh, flag up any patterns they see as being um, of concern to them in terms of the deaths of individuals in those settings, or indeed the, 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 the Crown uh, itself can, can raise a criminal investigation if they believe something is of that nature has happened. Um, but we certainly do recognise the concern that has been expressed by a number of witnesses and, and committee members about ensuring that um, inquiries are held when it's justifiable um, in, in, in those circumstances. Um, but we don't believe that mandatory FEIs in every case should be, should be held. Yeah, and I accept that, Minister. Can I just perhaps refer you to paragraph 117 of the policy memorandum where you say the various inquiries and investigations um, there is a case for them to be formalised and rationalised although not necessarily in legislation. The Scottish Government does not have a belief that this bill is a vehicle for this. Is there anything you want to add to that? Well I do, I do accept that perhaps um, there may be a degree of, of improving the clarity of what procedures are in place and certainly the role of different agencies in terms of uh, uh, flagging up any concerns about a, a death that has occurred in a uh, mental health uh, case, and perhaps it would be, uh, you know, possible to make make clear the, if you like, uh, almost the flow diagram of how how the system works, so that people are families and those affected are aware of it. But I, I certainly am aware of stakeholders who have called for mandatory um, inquiries in such situations. Um, I would hope would accept that not every case does a family actually want an inquiry to be held. Uh, often it can be um, quite apparent uh, what has caused the death. I mean, it could be natural causes uh, entirely uh, logically in a situation where people are um, just as vulnerable to diseases as those who are outside those settings. So um, I do think we have to have a flexible system that is um, adaptable. Uh, clearly, if the committee are, are concerned that there's lack of clarity as to how the system works in practice, that's something we could certainly address, and if, if that's the point that Mr Campbell is is trying to raise. Um, but I've maybe looked for guidance from him as to if I've well, understood if his point correctly. Let's move on to some of the, the, the written submission from the uh, Equality and Human Rights Commission, where it says the current system is confusing, e.g. Crown guidance to medical practitioners specifies that deaths in legal custody should be notified, but does not specify that deaths under mental health detention should be notified. Um, and there is a separate system of notification for health improvement Scotland and a local case review for clinical services. Um, so uh, it, it touches on some of, some of the problems in the existing system, um, where the you know, clearer guidance would clearly be helpful. Uh, well, certainly that's, that's a, a, a fair point. If, if those at the sharp end in the sector are concerned they don't have clarity of the procedures and the guidelines, then that's something that we could certainly take away from from today and, and come back to the committee convener if that would be helpful. Um, but uh, it's, it's certainly our intention is, is to avoid managed inquiries, but I do accept that you know, where people need to know, uh, you know what, what sufficient triggers there would be to, to call for an inquiry and, and how the Lord Advocate would exercise discretion if it came to that. So if there are um, weaknesses in terms of the guidelines, I'd, I'd be happy to, to look at any that the committee flag up. Yeah, I'm obviously just looking for reassurance from you, Minister, that even if we accept it's not a case for mandatory uh, um, 
inquiries that we need to ensure that the kind of the discretionary system, for want of a better word, uh, and the add-ons are kind of compliant with Article Two. I, I totally, uh, well, I certainly take that point from Mr. Campbell. I mean, it, it, we do need to uh, reflect if there are any um, gaps and guidelines which which raise concerns about human rights. But I would hope that we would be able to. Uh, come back to the committee with any uh, address any concerns that you raise in your stage one report. Um, I'd, I'd like to see the detail of the evidence you've received from witnesses and if there are specifics uh, to address them if we can. Um, but I take the point that Mr. Campbell makes. Okay, thank you, Minister. On mandatory inquiries and specifics, um, I would like to take the Minister to section two, subsection four B, which I raised with the Solicitor General. Um, and that is the death of a person was within the subsection, if at the time of death the person was, subsection B, a child required to be kept or detained in secure accommodation. Can the minister advise me, uh, does that mean that they are literally within the secure accommodation or is it simply the status of the child? Is that, um, something that Hamish, perhaps I could bring in Hamish yes. Beadle on this point, uh, convener. Um, do, you, do you mean, are they actually uh, within a building? It says kept or detained in secure accommodation is required, a child required to be kept or detained in secure Does that mean they are literally within secure accommodation? Does, does mean the status of the child is such, notwithstanding where they are, that the state has said they have to be kept for their own protection or for the protection of society in yeah. secure accommodation? Yeah, they would be actually within the secure accommodation. That was when it would apply. So is there a flaw there that um, for a child who is no longer and is just out of the secure accommodation for a matter of hours or, or something like that and they die and uh, it, should there not be a mandatory inquiry there where there may very well be reasons why they shouldn't have been out? After uh, all, the state's in charge. I believe, uh, could I bring in Greg on, on this point? Yes. That would be helpful. I'd sat in on the last evidence session yes. and the words... Um, required to be appear a few times in the section two yes. and certainly the intention in drafting the bill to take for example the example of a prisoner would be that if they're being taken out on a day trip or if they're off to hospital they are required to be detained they're not at liberty even if they're outside the prison walls so the intention in all of these cases including secure accommodation is that it doesn't literally mean within the building however if there's any feeling that there's any lack of clarity there we as a bill team will certainly take that away and reflect well, on Well, I think there is. I think because I've had to ask it. And, and the very thing is, are they within or out with? Now, the other part in that same section is 5B. Now, I don't know. It's for the purpose of persons in legal custody. If the person is, there's a list. Now, I don't know off the top of my head what section 56 of the Criminal Justice Scotland Act 2015 says. Does that mean that you could be in custody but not necessarily within a premises? The rest are all premises. But say you've been arrested uh, on the street and the police say, I'm taking you into custody. Does that, is that what that means? Yeah, the, the, the purpose of that provision is to widen the, the scope of where um, the mandatory uh, fatal accident inquiry would apply. So we're not just talking about someone who dies in a police cell or in a police station. If they have been arrested at a football match or in the street and then they suddenly die, that would trigger a mandatory fatal accident. Is that what uh, Section 56 says? Uh, I, can't I don't know if that's what that says, you see, because the rest is all places. Well, that was, that was the intent. I oh, it says remember. here, for the purposes of that, it doesn't matter whether the death occurred in secure accommodation, appeal institution, as the case yeah. may be, service, custody, premises. Does that take care of my two problems with the children in secure accommodation and somebody out in the street perhaps under arrest of the police who dies, the both would be mandatory. Does that take care of that? It certainly takes care of the one in relation to police custody. Um, that was the, 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 this, this amendment was made to the legislation at the request of, uh, well, Lord Cullen recommended it, but it was at the request of the Association of Chief Constables yes. in Scotland. And they pointed out that there was a slight um, discrepancy in the law uh, at, at, under the existing legislation, um, it only applied to police cells, police stations, but this widens it so that it's in police custody out with police stations. 
but it also says the purposes of subsection 4b, which is the one I've been going on about, secure accommodation. It then says it doesn't matter whether death occurred in secure accommodation, appeal institution, the case may be. So that doesn't cure the first issue, which is the child who may well, be out and about, does I it? I think Greg is already yeah. probably convener for me bring in for help, to help the committee's understanding of it. Yes. Bring Greg on this Just point to as pick well. up two points on that exchange, where it refers to the Criminal Justice Act 2015. That's the bill which this committee will have been scrutinising. So it's it's contingent well, on that. Well, we're scrutinising <laughs> an awful lot, so you'll need to remind yeah. me what that section actually says. I think says. first things first, if that act becomes enacted, yes. then, you know, as Hamish describes, the intention is for it to cover roadside detention and such right. like. so that's that one sorted. And I yeah. think the subsection Sorry. 6, which has just been brought up, is supportive of my interpretation, which was the Bill Team's interpretation, that it doesn't literally mean within the secure accommodation wing within the prison. It includes them out on a day trip or on, on the way to hospital or whatnot. Right. But as I've said, the Bill Team will consider all of the points on yes. drafting if the committee feels but it may But it may cure it. Uh, that, I you think, think, that, so, you think yeah. that does? Personally, but we'll reflect. Yes, on. well, that's fine. You've sorted that out for me. Yeah. I think just to clarify, I think it also covers uh, prisoner transport as well, convener, if that's of any use as well in terms of your understanding. No, I followed that bit, but it was a bit about the secure accommodation. Okay. It seems to it seems to also deal with that, so that if the child was out with the secure accommodation, it 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 doesn't it doesn't matter. They're still under the control of the state for the protection of the protection of the public. So that might cure it. Yes, thank you. So I'm happy now. I can't I don't want to know any more about it. This is Christian, Elaine and Jane. Thank you very much, Colina, <laughs> and good afternoon. Um, first of all, I would like to ask as a question about a, a surprise for, for the committee members that the service personnel uh, armed forces uh, were not employees. Uh, which we found uh, uh, very difficult to accept, but we've got the letter now from the Cross Office and Protocol of Fiscal Service, which explain in detail what it is. Uh, is there not a way that you could draft the bill differently to try to include the service personnel better? Uh, certainly, I'm happy to address that point, Convener. I, I must admit, I have to confess that um, Mr. Allard's point, I was also surprised, <laughs> um, but I appreciate it uh, represents long-standing uh, sort of legislative um, uh, uh, provisions in terms of service personnel. But the issue of FEIs and Tedesa service personnel in Scotland was, was not raised in Lord Cullen's review or during the consultation on the legislative proposal last year, which is why it's not dealt with in the way I think that, that uh, Mr. Allard is looking for in the current bill. Um, and this is a new issue, therefore, that we've had to consider in light of representations which have been made to the committee and indeed of, out with this committee um, from Mr Angus Robertson as well, MP for, for Murray. And given the defence reservation, um, any change to the law would have to be achieved by means of a Section 104 order, uh, which is already in contemplation for the bill and therefore um, agreed by the UK government. So we have had some initial informal discussion with the MOD about this and we believe there may be some room for... Uh, for further discussion on this issue to try and increase the scope and bring um, uh, deaths of service personnel in Scotland uh, into the scope of the bill. Uh, we will be writing to the MOD uh, after this committee uh, session to, to make that point to them and see, invite them to give their view to be fair to them rather than rely on informal discussions, uh, which my officials have had, to, to give them a formal chance to, to respond and see what scope there is to do that. But I certainly recognise the point Mr Allard has made and uh, we'd be happy to, to come back to the committee as soon as we've got a formal position from, from the Ministry of Defence as to whether they're willing to, to, to allow this under Section 104 order. Thank you very much. That would be very helpful. When would the timescale for that be, bearing in mind we've got Stage 2 after summer recess? And, um... I, well, we, we will get a letter off um, as soon as we can, convener, um, before, certainly before the, the, the summer recess, and I uh, hope that the MOD come back in time uh, for the Stage 2 process and, and committee. But you're not going to. If you, are, you, are you still on military personnel? No. Well, Jane, you want to come in on that? Yes. Thank you. Um, we've had some. We had discussion around this topic in, in the previous evidence session. So now I'm confused, convener, and I'm going to ask the minister to confirm. Therefore, do you think the wording in the bill, section two, subsection three, is wide enough to encompass service personnel and other crown servants? Are you, are you now saying that it isn't? What, what I'm saying, I mean, I, I, we can maybe invite um, Mr. Goodall to come in after I've, I've completed speaking, but just to um, uh, say that we, 
Okay. We, we believe that because this is a, a new issue, we haven't okay. addressed it in the bill as it stands, that it, because it's a reserved issue, we will need UK Government consent for a Section 104 order. We are happy to look at an amendment, potentially, if the, the um, uh, UK Ministry of Defence is, is happy for us to proceed on the basis of a Section 104 order in due course, uh, that we can look at uh, amending the, the bill at Stage 2. Um, so that's, that would be the plan. Um, but maybe see if okay. Hamish has got anything to add. I don't think there's anything I can add to that. I mean, it, it, the, the defence reservation is clear. Therefore, we, if, if this is going to be affected, it would have to be done by means of a Section 104 order. And we'll Which need to... Is, uh, under the Scotland Act 1998. Uh -huh. And uh, <laughs> can, you, can you explain the details? <laughs> <of section 94? laughs> Mr. Walker, well, you keep the buck gets passed to you a great deal <laughs> of the time. I hope he's buying the buns later. Come on. <laughs> um, these Section 104 orders are quite common for the more complicated bills, and essentially they're for consequential things that are within the policy intentions of the bill, but for technical reasons the Parliament doesn't have the competence to deal with itself. Um, just two related points. There hasn't been an intention on the bill team to change the meaning of the wording which appears in the 1976 Act. It's a slightly different form of words, but the intention wasn't to change. And of course this issue about military employment has come up very lately, so we'll reflect on all of that. And another point worth mentioning is there is the Section 7 in the Bill about service dress abroad. And the reason that can appear, even though elements of it relate to a reserve matter, is because it's simply restating existing law. So it's a slightly clunky picture, but that's why that's we've That's discretionary. Up... That's, yes, that's yes. discretionary. We understand that, but it's the mandatory. <clears throat> Would there be unintended consequences, of course, if you were the, for the MOD month? I don't want to help them particularly, but if you start within legislation to treat our personnel as employees, then you open it up to a whole lot of other issues within the law, the status of them within employment tribunals and so on, and rights of employees and everything else. Well, and, indeed, and that's, uh, I guess, one of the things we need yes. to consult with MOD on. Um, there, as I say, informally, there's been a, a willingness to discuss the issue and, and yeah. there's certainly no doors being closed on us so far. But, but it could do... be restricted to the, just for the purposes of a fatal accident inquiry. Service personnel will be treated as an employee, but could be... Could... I think, I think, I think can, can we will obviously have to be very careful with the, with the drafting that we don't undermine, as you say, um, uh, uh, existing provisions elsewhere, but if we can work with the MOD to, to find a, a suitable fix to this, we will certainly yeah. try and do so and, and keep the committee informed of do progress think on we're that. we're quite interested in that, are we? The committee is quite interested in, in that status. Always interested in fixes. Always interested <laughs> in fixes, he says. That's an advocate for Yes, you. indeed. <laughs> The honour of the advocates, Elaine followed by Jane. You, you're finished. You're not finished. You had another one. OK. Un autre. Or un autre. Since 1976, uh, the text was amended with the or. The word or was not placed as the same as the same place. You put the or in section B, employment or occupation, when uh, on the Act of 1976, it said, course of his employer or being employer or self-employed person was engaged in his occupation as such, which, which changed a, a, a little bit the sense. But I wouldn't want you to go back to 1976. To the contrary, I thought it was an, it, it was an improvement. Yes, we'll certainly reflect on all these points. Thank you very much. Uh, my second question was about deaf abroad. And uh, we had a lot of people coming in front of us telling us that we had no problem whatsoever uh, that there would be an amendment regarding uh, the fact that we need the body to be brought back to Scotland uh, for it uh, to be a, a, a fatal inquiry. So would, uh, would the government uh, be willing to move on that point? Well, um I certainly recognise this issue. I mean, I've, I've had the um, honour of meeting some of the parents, uh, Mr and Mrs Beveridge, who lost their son, Blair Jordan, um, and, uh, you know, very, very grateful for them explaining the process from their point of view and the, and the, and the weaknesses here. But I do recognise in this situation, I mean, uh, Blair's body was obviously found, and clearly there are circumstances in which uh, the body may not be found, and it is a very difficult issue for us to, to address. But um, to address that point, 
The issue of requirement that a body should be repatriated has been raised, obviously, um, here at the committee. Having had a look at it, the requirement that the body should be repatriated was not challenged during the government's consultation, which is why we've not addressed the issue in the bill bill to date. Indeed, in con consultees, including uh, Des uh, Abroad, you're not alone, uh, who gave evidence to the committee, I believe, uh, seem to want to have a system like coroner's inquest in the south, uh, where an inquest is only held if the body is returned, uh, in this case, to Scotland. Um, we can consider this again, uh, but the Crown Office believe that if there is to be no examination of the body, it may be very difficult in practice to produce evidence in court that provides a satisfactory explanation of the causes of death. So we have to recognise that the limitation in certain cases of not having the body in there for the limit that that would place on the on, on the value added by, by a fatal accident inquiry. And the reason the Crown Office would wish to have a body repatriated to the country is that there's no guarantee that had there been a, a proper examination of the, 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 the corpse, the, um, indeed a proper determination of the cause of death, whereas the court occurred abroad and, and the body was disposed of and not repatriated. Um, the for a body. It, indeed, um, I think this is the difficulty, though, is for, for the authorities here is if, if we have um, a situation where a death is being reported abroad, the investigation is being conducted abroad, any physical evidence is there for abroad, and we have no body in which to, 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 to conduct a post mortem for either toxicology or, or some other uh, reason to explain perhaps what may have happened in these circumstances. It does limit the ability of the FEI to, to actually add any value. Uh, in the absence of the body, in the absence of um, pathology uh, and toxicological tests, there is no way of knowing whether the individual was intoxicated or, or affected by drugs or alcohol, which may have played a part in their death. So it, it may still remain un, undetermined, um, albeit there may be circumstances which might be presented, and I've indeed have asked uh, officials' circumstances if, in the instance where Blair died, if he had or another child had, had died and fallen overboard and had been witnessed someone falling over the body hadn't been found, what would we do in those circumstances? Um, so I'm, I'm happy that we, we have a look at that and see if there's anything we can do to, to address the issue. But I just I suppose I'm raising there are some limitations on, on what that may yet uh, mean for, for the outcome in terms of an FEI and whether there would be any value added. So it would still be at the discretion of Lord Advocate and um, he may have to take a decision that, um, that if it, 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 it wouldn't add, add value to the, to the family or anyone else. Uh, without the presence of a body. I'm not sure if um, Hamish could come in. I know he's looked at this area very closely. There are additional problems in that, um, you know, if, if someone simply goes missing in a foreign country, would that trigger a fatal accident inquiry? And it does occasionally happen that people seek to fake their own deaths. So, again, that, you know, I don't think that would, a fatal accident inquiry would be appropriate in those cases. Um, but it, it, you know, it's it's um, there are undoubtedly circumstances where you know there can be no doubt that a death has occurred, um, and it may be because of the the kind of accident that the, the body may not simply exist anymore. It's exactly the body making exceptional circumstances uh -huh, well, to be very clear. But, but it's what people yeah. are asking for. Do if they go missing because it says it could be sudden, suspicious, or unexplained, yes. or a current circumstances giving rise to serious public concern. Yeah, so certainly. It wouldn't just be if they went missing. Yeah, I mean, I think we remember that the Lord Advocate in this situation would have discretion as he would anyway with the yeah. situation where the body was repatriated. Sorry. Um, so maybe it will be the Lord Advocate could, could say, well, actually, in circumstances, I think there is maybe a case for investigation. Um, but we'd have to be realistic about what that might be able to yield with the absence of the body. It will limit mm. the, inevitably the, the scope of the, the investigation back home because the physical evidence of the, of the body is, is, is very helpful in determining the cause of death. But if I may, you know, if, if time permits, just bring um, Greg Walker in. and He he's, has some expertise in terms of... We've been death. missing you, Mr Walker. <laughs> it's <laughs> your turn <tub> again. <laughs> <laughs> death, death at sea and indeed and, and death in the North Sea in terms of the offshore sector. Yes. Well, similar issues can arise and it may be helpful and instructive just that's to... What Christian was also to, thinking to of a fishing vessel, mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. like that, you know, in, in Norton Scottish territorial waters, body can't be retrieved. It's a point that hasn't come out in evidence yet, which is about Section 5, which is really about the North Sea oil and gas area. And you'll see there that unlike Section 7, there's no requirement for repatriation. So this is just continuing the 1976 Act. So just to make the committee aware that if, heaven forbid, there is a North Sea accident where the bodies couldn't be recovered, that wouldn't, under the current law, preclude an FEI. 
but I imagine the distinguishing factors from abroad abroad are you're dealing with an area of Scots law, you're dealing with eyewitnesses who speak in English, who can speak the fiscal and so on. It's quite different from being in, the, in an oil operation on the other side of the world. On the other hand, you wouldn't want, uh, 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 having reformed the law if this goes through, you wouldn't want to have a circumstance where there's a death abroad which fulfils all the criteria as to whether or not the um, Crown should the uh, Crown should uh, have an FAI. Um, and but just simply because there's no body, you could still establish the cause of the cause of death uh, uh, and have an inquiry into it. You wouldn't want to be in that position. It might be very rare, but that's the things that the law tends to throw up the unexpected when you think you've got everything I, I, absolutely in place. I agree, convener, and, and I, th I suppose that's why, uh, because it was, um, I, I'd heard so much uh, testimony from Mr and Mrs Beveridge about Blair's case, it kind of sprung to mind there could be a situation where, uh, again, you know, a British registered vessel, um, you know, so there's a good prospect of getting uh, cooperation from the company involved, yes. which we probably yes. would have had in that situation. And uh, that uh, you know there was an unexplained death, but in this case, if somebody had perhaps seen, uh, or at least an eyewitness had seen something like you know the, the uh, or heard a splash or heard someone shouting as they fell overboard or something like that, you, you might have had reason to believe that had happened. That would allow you to to understand that a death had occurred <coughs> or most likely to have occurred, and and then perhaps uh, it'd be worth investigating how that death had occurred in terms of the yeah. the nature of the the incident that had led to the individual falling overboard. So I think you know we. We are flexible in this, but we will look to see what we can do. We just want to be realistic with the committee and not, not no, um, you know, give right. false, false expectations that it would automatically lead to, to an explanation as to the death. Uh, it's going to be more far more difficult without the body, unfortunately. Elaine, followed by Jean, please. Yes, can, uh, in your opening statement, Minister, you gave some indications to why you thought that the Sheriff's recommendation should be published on the SCTS website rather than on the Scottish Government's own website. Would you expect SCTS to have to monitor compliance with the Sheriff's recommendations? Well, we certainly... Um, I, you're, you're correct in that we... I made a point in my opening remarks, and I, I firmly believe that it would be advantageous for SCTS to, to publish um, the uh, response to the Sheriff's recommendations. I think it, it probably does... I don't want to overstate the point, but it probably does give more credibility to the whole process of the... Sheriff is giving recommendations and then people responding to the Sheriff as to whether they are or are, are not going to be taking forward those recommendations and why not in the case of not taking them forward. So I think that, that helps the process. Um, in terms of the, the um, point you make about uh, the uh, monitoring of those recommendations, uh, it probably would be the case that um, it would be uh, a resource issue that I suppose that the SCTS would, would face in terms of monitoring them. But Section 26 of the Bill provides for the dissemination of the Sheriff's dis determination to each person to whom a recommendation is addressed and any other person whom the Sheriff considers has an interest in the recommendation. And this clearly could include any regulatory body um, with power to implement change, possibly on a UK-wide basis. So I would hope that you know if it, if it did have implications for health and safety or did have health implications for maybe uh, environmental issues, that the, the regulatory bodies would, would be monitoring the, the uh, performance of the person to, or persons to whom the recommendation be made as to whether they took forward the steps that have been recommended by the sheriff. So in some way, shape or form, a relevant organisation or body would, would monitor progress. But as a whole, uh, I think the, the issue you may be getting at as to whether SETS should be monitoring the performance over all of the recommendations that are made as to how many of them are, are followed through. I don't think it would be um, realistic for us to expect SCTS to do that within their resource. Yeah. In that case, would you uh, envisage that the Lord Advocate or possibly yourselves as Scottish Ministers would have an oversight role? Well, I think the, the difficulty in, in relation to the, um, uh, the government uh, or indeed the Lord Advocate as the Scotland Senior Law Officer doing that is that there's no sort of policy intention in the, in the bill uh, to monitor recommendations centrally. Um, each set of recommendations is, is, um, is in respect to an individual inquiry and is particular to that situation, albeit I guess if there being recommendations are then disseminated to a regulatory body, they probably have wider implications which are being flagged up to, to that regulatory body. And I would hope they're addressed at that point by that body rather than uh, by the Lord Advocate having to, to, to push the case or indeed uh, myself. Uh, or another minister. 
Um, but clearly we would have an interest in uh, anything which had implications for Scottish Government policy and we, indeed it's possible that the, the, the Sheriff may disseminate recommendations to the Scottish Government where it's relevant to do so or the UK Government. So um, we would have an interest at that point. Yeah. Right. Um, I don't know if um, Elaine's finished that point. No, I wasn't. Well, not, not completely, but... <laughs> no, you didn't proceed. Don't <laughs> and barge in. <laughs> well, uh, you know that the uh, British Ferguson proposed that the Sheriff's recommendations would be legally binding. Now, I understand uh, from the uh, explanatory note why uh, ministers have rejected that offer. You've chosen to reject that. Uh, would you be prepared to consider legal sanctions against those who fail to respond to a Sheriff's recommendations as a sort of contempt of court type of... Process. I I um I don't believe that would be um, helpful, and, and I'll try and explain why. I mean, I'm happy to look at the issue, but what we're trying to have is an inquisitorial inquiry, and to get um, as much help from all the the parties involved who may have a, a role in uh, helping us understand how someone has died and the circumstances and what lessons we can learn. I think the more that we kind of create uh, potential for it to be seen as um, threatening for those boys to be involved or to engage with it, it may, may be um, potentially undermine the process of trying to get to the truth. Um, but I do take the point, clearly, if there was something which was uh, which had potential to to save lives, I would hope that being flagged up by you know to the health and safety executive, to the Scottish government, to the UK government as as necessary, and that we as legislators can uh, take forward something. If it's as fundamental as that, the, whichever appropriate government or, or agency could then regulate to ensure that that happens. Uh, more widely, and I think that's one of the reasons why it'd be useful to disseminate sheriff's recommendations to to the regulators to ensure that they um, take on board those messages and make sure that regulation is kept up to date with evidence of potential dangers to people at work. So, I would hope that there, we could achieve the outcome that that I think Dr. Murray wants, but without having to to have a threat um, in terms of the legal sanction anybody for failing to deliver on the recommendations. Your your principal concern is that legal sanction would. Make the process more adversarial. Well, we, we, we are certainly trying way. to avoid it becoming adversarial and to to, uh, to to get to a situation where everyone has to be tooled up with lawyers to take part in an in a inquiry. Certainly, you know, clearly there are circumstances where lawyers need to be present and maybe act on behalf of families if they need to, someone to adv advocate their concerns and raise their questions. But uh, equally, we don't want it to become a, a gladiatorial or adversarial kind of environment. We want people to be able to speak freely and get to the truth as to what happened to that individual or individuals and to answer why they died and how they died and what could be done to prevent it happening again. Um, and I think the, 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 the less um, uh, legalistic we can keep it, the, the, the better in that respect, albeit we've got a sheriff overseeing the process and clearly using their, their legal knowledge to ensure it's, it's, it's conducted um, fairly and, uh, and with rigour. Uh, but we want to avoid a situation where it's, it's seen as being... Um, uh, you know, a, a challenging setting in that sense, and people start close close up the doors and bring down the shutters and don't want to participate. But I don't know whether there's anything in terms of the consultation responses on that point that maybe Hamish might be aware of. Um, there was fairly strong um, support for the proposals in the government's bill, which is basically that a party to whom a recommendation is addressed is obliged to respond. Now, they don't have to comply with the Sheriff's recommendation, which, after all, is only that. It's only a recommendation. It doesn't bestow rights and obligations. Um, so they have to respond saying what they've done in relation to compliance, what they intend to do, or if they're not going to comply, then they have to say why they're not going to comply. If they do not respond at all, that that fact will be noted beside the Sheriff's determination on the SCTS website. But that's, that's as far as we, we, we think we can go. And that, I mean, that will become public knowledge that a body has not, uh, has not responded. The Crown Office um, uh, tell us, however, that in, mo in the vast majority of cases, um, those people to whom recommendations are addressed tend to take them very seriously indeed. And I would, I would suggest that it's unlikely that there will be very many instances where parties choose not to respond at all. And the, the other aspect, if I may add, Convener, um, just for Dr Murray's benefit, is that we were trying to arrive at a situation where we didn't want sheriffs to feel they should be reluctant about making recommendations because they might be too 
too too onerous or too difficult for the, uh, the organisation to to respond to. So I suppose if 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 we um, allow the shares freedom, if you like, to in their best judgment to recommend what they think would have you know in the future would would be uh, helpful to avoid a similar situation arising. Um, then that gives them maximum scope to, to make their points and, and hopefully the organisations can respond in the manner that Hamish Goodall has set out, either positively and that they have taken forward the recommendations or if it's not practical to do so for some reason or it's uh, economically unfeasible to do it, um, then they c can respond as to why that's the case and to help inform the process. That may in, in, in turn help inform the regulators as to what's realistic and what pra what's practical for that company or sector and even uh, to do uh, across across the board. So hopefully it will keep the information flow going and and you will yield, even if there's a negative response, you maybe yield useful information that might be used by regulators or others to um, to inform future policy. Thanks. Right. Um, Mr Tom Marshall, um, in his evidence on the 19th of May, uh, he called for recommendations to be made to the sheriff rather than to the SCTS as a way of keeping the inquiry process open. I'm not sure whether you've fully touched on that. And one of the other things he put forward in his written submission dated the 22nd is that the Justice Committee itself could monitor recommendations and responses as part of Parliament's policy of assessing the effectiveness of legislation. Can you just comment on both of those points? Um, well, I, 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 don't, I don't want to... Um, uh, to, to determine the, the role of the Justice Committee. I think that's for the Justice Committee to determine what um, feel is the appropriate role for, for the committee in this respect. But um, the point uh, regarding um, reporting uh, is, is an important one. I think just since um, Roderick Campbell mentions Tom Marshall, I think uh, uh, I'd just like to make the point, Convener, that even Tom Marshall himself said that it's unrealistic to have a mandatory inquiry in every case of industrial disease as well. And he has also made points which are um, uh, very supportive uh, in terms of the reporting process as well. But I do think um, it's, it's important that we uh, do have some scrutiny of the individual decisions that are made um, by companies or organisations in responding to sheriff recommendations. I don't necessarily, my own personal view is that it wouldn't necessarily be appropriate for the Justice Committee to do so, but if the Justice Committee felt it had a role, then I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, wouldn't prevent that, because I think post legislative scrutiny is a very important function of the Parliament and perhaps something that uh, um, we, we should do more of. But the, um, the Sheriff's role is finished after the determination, um, and uh, you know, that's on the basis that it would probably be time consuming for the Sheriffs to, to continue to oversee the process of recommendations coming back and perhaps be inappropriate for them to do so when they're, they're having to take on other cases. But um, clearly, as, as Hamish Goodall has said, if information is presented which suggests why an organisation hasn't been able to take forward a recommendation, then that is open to the regulators and others, including those who are concerned about the practices in that organisation, to flag that up. And there's a reputational issue there. So I would hope that the process would be effective in, in driving change within those organisations to whom recommendations were made. Um, and the... Uh, and it wouldn't necessarily be appropriate for, for sheriffs to continue the role after that point, which is, after all, a judicial function rather than a uh, monitoring and evaluation function in that respect. Thank you. I understand you might not have seen that response. Has it just come to us this morning, no. Minister? Is that correct? I haven't seen that myself, no, uh, no. Convener. No. Sorry. Um, yeah, I was just a bit distracted there to see whether um, responses had to be published, but they do under Section 275A. Yep. Um, which would be important now. Who have I got now? Jane, thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask a little bit about delays and whether you think, Minister, that this concept of an early hearing, as proposed by Lord Cullen, would give um, would, would help to speed up proceedings, if you, if you think that, that that would be a, a positive impact on, on the process? Well, I certainly um, recognise the point that, that Jane Baxter is making about the need to um, avoid unnecessary delays. The whole bill is designed to make the process more efficient and effective in delivering an FEI and, and clearly anything we can do to uh, smooth the process and make sure it happens as effectively as possible is, is helpful. Um, I think uh, well, I wasn't present for the Solicitor Gen General's evidence. Um, I have uh, been made aware of the point that was made regarding a milestone charter. Uh, and I think that's a constructive suggestion, which obviously Solicitor General is going to come back to the committee with more detail, I understand, on, on that. Um, 
uh, that in, its sen in a sense will help ensure that um, I think at a three month interval the Solicitor General is referring to that there would be um, review by the Crown Office itself of where they're at with the inquiry, what needs to be done um, in terms of making sure it happens and to ensure the minimum delay in the process. So I, I think that's a very constructive suggestion. It would, I, th I would hope, largely uh, deal with the intent behind Lord Cullen's recommendations in that respect. And it's also worth stating, just, just for the record, that, that the Crown Office have made, um, I believe, significant efforts in recent years to keep families themselves better informed about uh, the progress of death investigations and therefore we don't believe um, uh, open to, to points being made by the committee obviously in its report but we don't believe there is therefore a need to hold such hearings in every case which is what's suggested by Lord Cullen um, and uh, the Lord President um, uh, I think made a, a valid point when he said he'd not like the court to be put in a position of exercising some supervisory role over the Crown's decision making process as that would give rise to serious constitutional issue and I sure. did hear the Crown this morning saying they were bringing forward a charter yes, which Wilson they bring charter. before the committee before stage two, which should be helpful. I, I believe that will. I mean, it's a very positive uh, move by the Solicitor General, and I think it will help uh, deal with the, the, the intent, I, I imagine, of committee members to make sure that families are well yeah. informed and that everything is done to, to bring forward the inquiry as quickly as it can be. The flexibility in the bill actually about accommodation should also help in that respect, I believe. Thank you. And just lastly, do, do you think that COP, COPFS is adequately resourced to take on these, not new roles, but, but um, enhancements to the role? Do you think they, that that will become a resource implication as time goes on? Well, well clearly, um, I, would, I would hope that any pro problems that are uh, raised by the Crown Office in terms of resourcing of that would be raised at the Justice Board and would be dealt with um, uh, at that level and, and recommendations come forward but any changes are necessary. But I believe it is an efficiency measure that it will help in terms of the proposal that the uh, Solicitor General has brought forward will help ensure that um, there's good coordination of the, the commencement of an inquiry that uh, minim minimise any risks of uh, potentially unnecessary costs by you know, delays or, or um, any problems in the initial process. So that, in a sense, could be seen to be preventative spend in some ways, that it will make sure the inquiry happens more smoothly and appropriate location and, uh, and resourced appropriately. So I would hope that it wouldn't be particularly onerous on, on the Crown Office, but clearly if there are issues as, as uh, the uh, legislation is applied, then we would keep that uh, under close watch and, and help if necessary uh, with the Crown Office. Um, and uh, just, uh, just to raise the point that the Crown Office have obviously aware of the bill, they have looked at the financial uh, memorandum and, and are comfortable with the, the figures in there. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Alison. Thank you very much. Um, good morning. Um, morning. We are. Uh, oh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. afternoon. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, it's Sorry, it's afternoon. Convenient. I know the feeling. <laughs> <laughs> the committee's currently got in front of it a couple of active petitions relating to how um, the, the COPFS carries out death investigations. Have you given any consideration, Minister, to whether there's scope for introducing a review process which families can use if they're unhappy about the way in which that death investigation has been carried out? Well, um, certainly I'll be, be happy to, to take on board any points that are made and specific concerns in that respect. We have obviously uh, seen the Crown Office bring in family liaison positions, which are, you know, it's, it's obviously um, uh, a lo local sheriffdom, the extent to which they are deployed will, may vary from one year to another. So we'd like to see, ensure there's consistency uh, in that process. But the judicial review um, is the due legal process available in this situation. Uh, and uh, we can certainly um, address that in, in, in due course, so perhaps uh, once we have a chance to reflect on the evidence that the committee has received, we can come back. Uh, will you perhaps, as part of that reflection, then consider whether or not it would be appropriate for a sheriff to be invited to, I suppose, adjudicate on whether or not it was appropriate um, that the investigation had been closed? Um, I, I think, um, if I may, if, if, I don't know whether it's, is it Greg, are you happy to, happy to address this point? If I may convene or bring him, he's earning his crust today, as you can see. <laughs> <laughs> We're missing you already, Mr Walker. <laughs> I, Greg Walker thank you. I think there's two points. You used the word scope, and this is a bill about inquiries, and it's not a bill about the investigation stage. So perhaps this charter, which will be published, can address these sorts of points, but I'd suggest it's not for this particular bill. And on the point about a sheriff have a greater role, I think that's squarely in the territory 
of the Lord President's concerns about constitutionality that, you know, the Scottish tradition, which we heard predates the coroners, is um, to investigate, to have the discretion to investigate deaths and um, to have a sheriff review that is something the judges aren't comfortable with. And as the minister said, although I wouldn't encourage this to happen routinely, Crown decisions can be judicially reviewed under the ordinary grounds for judicial review. Okay. Thank you. Yes, uh, right. This is the final one, I think, and that's just about with regard back to families. I wonder if Minister, I don't expect you to, to pull this rabbit out of the hat just now. If you could provide the committee with the cost to the Legal Aid Fund of supporting families at FAIs in the past three years. There are issues involved in, obviously, the FAI is in the public interest, but families obviously have a great interest themselves in, in what takes place and quite often require legal aid representation. And so it would be helpful to know that or any other comment you might wish to make about legal aid to families. Well, certainly, um, it, I, I agree, Convener, that um, that is an important issue because while, while the inquiry is there to establish in the public interest what has happened to an individual or individuals and to find the cause of death um, and to learn lessons and obviously disseminate those lessons and recommendations. Uh, we do recognise the very important role that, that the inquiry is playing. It's not maybe the statutory purpose, but they are there and they provide a, a very helpful um, uh, uh, service, if you like, to families to help them understand what happened to a loved one. And in many cases, uh, they may require to raise some questions themselves. So the role of um, the Legal Aid Board um, they are making legal aid available where a person entitled to be represented at an FEI can show they have concerns with which a Procurator Fiscal is not going to raise at the inquiry themselves, because obviously the Procurator Fiscal has a specific role and is acting, um, if you like, for, for the public interest at that point. Any application for legal aid will be subject to the usual three yeah, statutory... I know, I know all that stuff, sorry, Minister, sorry. time presses on, but Lord Cullen's recommendations were that you weren't going ahead with legal aid funds on cost grounds, so if you want to dispel that, we need to know what has been given in the last three years and, you know, why. I know the test is yep. about reasonableness, but, you know, in, these are very different circumstances being in a civil case. Yeah, well, we'll certainly um, look at the figures that you've asked for, convener, in terms okay. of try and provide them for the committee's benefit. The, um, the Scottish Human Rights Commission acknowledged in its own evidence before the committee that there was no ECHR issue with the current provision of legal aid for FEIs, uh, and we certainly haven't um, seen any changes in circumstances which would cause the Scottish Government to revisit its attitude to the provision of legal aid for FEIs, but as uh, I think you know, convener, we are doing work on on legal aid at the moment anyway, yes. so I will certainly take that into the, the, the remit of that work and look at if there's any this scope. This is kind of sweeping up questions. And one is, again, the bill removes the sheriff's power to award expenses. Um, why? When there might be somebody abusing process, and one would feel that expenses should be awarded against them for costing the court and everybody else's time and money. If I can uh, ask Hamish to address that. I know he's, he's yeah, at um, well, um, expenses are awarded in civil litigation. Um, oh. A fatal accident inquiry is not civil litigation. No. And we believe that the sheriff, if someone is behaving vexatiously at a fatal accident inquiry, we believe that the sheriff has sufficient case management powers to be able to deal with that without uh, any award of expenses. So the proposal Against them? Yeah. Is that not the case just now? Can they not award if you've got vexatious? I believe there, has, there was one case recently... Um, so you're changing the position. This is what I'm saying. Why? Because, because we don't feel that this is appropriate. Because, as I say, expenses are awarded in civil litigation. This is not civil litigation. Greg, do you want to...? There's a wider picture in the background, which is the Courts Reform Act, where the the civil courts review was moving to all the civil courts with all their hats on mo much more actively managing cases so the power to make court rules has been expanded and the power here for um, FAI rules to be made by the Lord President is again expanded with the ex expectation that much more than has happened to date there will be active case management at all stages so I suppose what we're saying is rather than letting parties get away with murder and then punish them later the sheriff will from the outset be able to stop wastes of time so there shouldn't be wasted costs expenses on anyone's part 
Well, we'll hold you to that if it's not going to be in the bill. Uh, can I thank you very much for your evidence? I'm conscious of time. Uh, and if there's anything else, once, Minister, you have the opportunity to look at the evidence we've had that you want to comment on, that you've not had the opportunity, we've not questioned you on from previous witnesses uh, this morning, please feel free to do so. Thank, thank you, you very much. I'm moving on to the next item on the agenda. Um, if you'll forgive me, Minister, I'll just press on. Um, it's item four, our annual report uh, from 11th May 2014 to 10th May 2015. This is a factual account of the areas of work we've undertaken during that period. Here it is in all its glory. Are you content? John. Uh, just two, two very minor points, if I may, and that's on the first paragraph of parag paragraph 24. I think if we just refer to the second line, I think we, we should insert many significant implications there. Um, What's this one? Yes, that's all right. Yes, I, if everybody's agreed, the significant implications the opt out would have. And one other small point, if I may, too, and that is. Paragraph 32. Yes. Uh, the final line to where it says they provided witness with an opportunity to engage with each other. I think we should insert engage with the Justice Committee and each other. <laughs> yes. yes, it's rather like we were sitting having <laughs> yeah, cups of tea. We were spectating. Okay. <laughs> Just spectating. So uh, that's a sort of more grammatical, yes. Christian. Uh, it covers right up to the end of May 2015. I just said to a colleague... We Sorry, beg your pardon? You, it says uh, the report covers right up to the 10th of May 2015. I just thought, I told the colleague this morning we were dealing with six bills just now. Is it applicable when we're not starting to deal with it before? Yeah, or two, three, three, four, five. Which one? Yes, we can reflect the apologies bill call for evidence. Well, six. Well, you just want to get the six. right number on, yes. yes. So we'll put the apologies bill early stages call for evidence. Thank you. Um, right. We now move into private session, which is as we are now.